Guys, I'm hearing some banging. I have to go check. I'll be right back. And then live on custom streaming service. Oh, hold on. It's it's coming up. Sounds like the play it's a playback, uh, Peter. We got some kind of loop going on. Oh, yeah, man. Man. yeah, it's playing back when you do when you do the. Uh, we got some kind of loop. Going. The second recording. Okay button you hit no, it's, it's, what was that no. No, we keep getting this loop testing testing hit the got it button so that's the recording did you you have a a got it button on your screen a what a button in the okay, middle. Good of evening, everyone. Welcome to golf committee meeting. Today is April 13th. And um, oh, I know what it it's is. It's Derek Kirk. <laughs> is there a council meeting? No, it's probably a budget meeting. They've been having budget meetings yeah, every that's day. That's overlapping with us. Ow. That was not a re that was a recording from April 13th for the golf committee. Oh, the golf committee, I know, is Derek Curtin. Yeah, that was Richard uh, Rickford Curtin speaking, but that's something uh, uh, like I recorded. Yeah, Rickford. Rickford. Where'd Peter go? I think he's you trying to log go? in and log back out to see if it's his uh, his machine that's doing that. Let's wait a second, Mr. Chair. Yeah, it sounded like he was playing back a recording instead of recording. Yeah. We we seem to be we seem to be recording. Yeah, we're recording now. But when you go to the um, YouTube, that's where I think somehow it's playing back something else. Yeah, uh, I don't. So we uh, can just go with the recording. We don't have to do okay. it on YouTube. Uh, we can put it on YouTube later. Yes. We just don't have you, Peter. I know. We can hear you. Oh, yep. your video is off. Oh, there you are. Did it come up? Did I Not come up? Not yet. Not no. yet. You're upside down, too. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't mess with him. <laughs> he holds our lives in it. There, no. there we go. There he is. There he is. Okay. Yay. <laughs> let's okay. Let's let's start all over again. All right. Okay. Now, Kevin, you, Kevin is saying you wish to be muted and not on screen. Is that correct? If you can hear me. I think he's off screen too. <laughs> no, I'm I'm here. I'm muted no. for a few minutes. I'm just restarting my computer. It's running the install. And I'll, I'll jump in the video in about 10 minutes. Okay. All right. 
So we will start the meeting. Call the meeting to order. It is 7.08 p.m. on April 18th, 2022. This is the Inland Wetlands and Water Course Commission. And present we have Barry Burston, Kevin Wilcox, Katie Blint, uh, David Layupa, uh, Kevin Hussein, kind of, and myself, Alan Budkowski. Um, old business update on uh, notice of violation of 38 pheasant chase. Please say it's done. No, it's not done. Uh, your uh, your um, packet included a one-page uh, memo, uh, updated memo, saying that uh, the uh, uh, plan has been um, uh, filed on the land records along with the permit. And I spoke with Mr. Um, Gavel on the phone, and when he came in to pick up his mylars for filing, that. Um, He's, you know, the, the commission is going to want an update by the 16th and before any plants are put in the ground or any digging gets done, he's got to post his bond and I want to be there to, when they cite where the plants go. Both of those were your guys conditions of approval. So there should be an update. Uh, hopefully it'll be a positive one. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful. Uh, the meeting of the May the 16th per year guys uh, you know, requirements from two months ago in, in January. So that that's the update there. All right, and his engineer is gonna be supplying a report? Yes, whatever was required for the, uh, for the, um, uh, you know, from the, from the permit conditions of approval. He's, he's complied with, uh, you know, the first two or three, and I think he's, He's going to finish up, hopefully, with the rest of them, and we'll have an update at the next meeting. Um, do any of you guys want to be uh, um, uh, notified when the plantings are going to be done? Um, yeah, I would like to be. I don't know if I'm available, but you know, I would like okay. to. Yeah, I would too. You would too. Do, do right. you mean so? Do you mean so that we can be there? Well, no. I don't need to be on site, I don't think. Just notified. Oh, I would like to go on site. Okay. I believe that that's, a, that's appropriate as long as it's not a quorum. Uh, right. You guys can come to the, to the site. I will send out a general email to the Wetlands Commission when I find, when I get that date. Okay. Okay? Yep. Great. All right. So <clears throat> we're going to allow... Daniel Jameson and James McManus right, to, uh, to speak for the next two applications. Uh, except uh, I, I just want to, um, uh, well, no, we should take these uh, public hearings uh, okay. first. There's two public hearings here. We should open them one, one at a time, but uh, we requested additional information. So there will be, um, uh, or it is recommended that the public hearings be continued to the next meeting. But I think it's also important to hear the applicant's presentation. If the presentation uh, brings up any questions for the commission, uh, here we are. Uh, hopefully they can be answered um, before the next meeting. Um, one of the things that we're looking for for the first application uh, is, is uh, is a uh, really a second second opinion on the wetlands delineation, and I spoke to uh, I spoke to the uh, soil scientist who's going to do that uh, just today, um, and we didn't anticipate that he would have his information ready for this meeting. In fact, he hasn't gone to the site yet. Peter, but let's open the public right. hearing before you go too deep into this. You're absolutely right. Sorry, Alan. Go ahead. Oh, no problem. Okay. I, I move, open the public uh, hearing. I, I, I move that we open the public hearing for the wetlands map amendment application, Douglas Street Ventures LLC, applicant and owner 59 and 69 Douglas Street. Is there a second? Yeah, we're not. Second. 
Second by Kevin Hussain. All in favor, say aye. 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 Hussain, it's unanimous. All right. Okay. Now we're good, Peter. Sorry. There's a hand up. Yeah. The, you know what? There should there should also be a, a shut up button. You know. But shut up for what? <laughs> Other than the no, don't mute. Oh. You know? <laughs> well, I I could mute you, but then you wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, so we want to bring in Jameson. Uh, hmm. We're going to bring them in as panelists, James. We would like to be. All right, uh, Jim McManus, I don't have a video tonight, but uh, some whatever reason, I, I hope you all can hear me. We yes. can hear you, yep. I'll promote you anyway. Okay, I might be. Uh... Oh, okay. Okay, great. Uh, there we go. Evening. Uh, good evening. I may say I'm Daniel Jameson, but I'm really not. I'm Peter Denali, President of Design Professionals. And Daniel Jameson is in our conference room over at 21 Jeffrey Drive in South Windsor. Uh, and uh, he will be joining us momentarily. Uh, we have the ability to share exhibits now, correct? Yep. 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 Yeah, it, it's, okay, it's up already. Yeah. All right, good. Okay, so why don't we go to the first one, the other one, the one that, the, what, yeah, for the uh, wetlands survey. The map amendment application. Is yes, the so map. Right? map that's, that's the first one we want, first exhibit. Again, Peter DeMalley, President of Design Professionals Offices at 21 Jeffrey Drive here in South Windsor. Also with me this evening is Daniel Jameson, a licensed professional engineer in the state of Connecticut. Uh, he is also a project manager on this project. He's at our office uh, with me. And as well, we have Jim McManus, who's uh, the owner of Wetland uh, and a wetland scientist from JMM Wetland Consulting Services in Newtown, Connecticut. Uh, he's on, and we saw his name was up there, so I guess he's good to go, and we heard from him. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, allowing us to make a preliminary presentation to you, because as Mr. Castaldi indicated, uh, we have two outstanding items. Uh, the first one is a third party, as requested by the Commission, a third party soil scientist slash wetland scientist review, uh, and Ian Cole will be doing that uh, just shortly after this, I believe he indicated. Uh, 10 a.m. on next Monday. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Castaldi happens to be available that day, but it'd be great if he could uh, attend with Mr. Cole, uh, the third party soil scientist, so that he can go out and look at the site uh, with Mr. Castaldi if he's available. Uh, that way we can uh, have his report in well in time before your next meeting. Uh, so we're hopeful for that. Uh, we also have uh, an outstanding comment. We've addressed most comments from the town engineer. Uh, and uh, we, we have one still remaining uh, with respect to hydrology of the uh, wetlands, uh, remaining wetlands and the created wetlands. Uh, and we'll be working with Mr. Castaldi and Mr. Tessie uh, with respect to that. Uh, and we may have some comments on that uh, later this evening. But first, I'd like to just tell you about the subject property a little bit. Um, Jim McManus will be in more detail. Excuse me, Daniel. Uh, Peter. What we this is a wetlands boundary. All we need to know is what you found and what, where you disagree with staff and any areas that may be questionable. We are not looking for a history on the site. Okay. Um, we, like, we like precise answers to our questions and we you know, hope that you respect that. Thank you. Okay, I, I won't get into any further detail with respect to the location of the site, then I'll just turn it over to Jim McManus, uh, who's the wetland scientist on this. He's gonna to explain to you about his wetlands determination, uh, how he went out with Mr. Castaldi and what they agreed to. Uh, Jim, it's your, the floor is Thank yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening all. Uh, Jim McManus, uh, Certified Professional Soil Scientist, JMN Wetland Consulting Services with offices in Newtown, Connecticut. I uh, visited the site twice. Uh, to delineate wetlands. Once was in April of 2021 and then back again in August of 2021. And I found three isolated wooded swamps. Uh, they're shown on the, on, the, uh, on the map as green areas, three small to relatively small isolated wetlands. Um, I went out with Mr. Castaldi on March 18th of this year, 2022. And we had two minor changes. We 
added, I uh, moved one flag, flag number 10, about 12 feet to the west. And I added a flag 6A, uh, which kind of rounded out between uh, six and seven, I added one additional flag. You see there it says 6A, that sort of rounded out that wetland a little bit. And I moved wetland 10, uh, 12 feet to the west. And that was uh, all we did, everything else. Mr. Castaldi, and he can speak to, for, for himself, but we seem to agree with the remainder of the wetlands. And there is a little, uh, in the, on a long, along the uh, Western property line, there's a small offsite wetland that pinches on just, just barely get, and we looked at that and uh, we were satisfied with all those locations. So that was about it. But I guess, I think during your guys' walk, you had additional uh, questions. So I guess we have somebody who's going to do another review shortly. That's it. That was about it. Uh, Peter staff report. Yeah, um, I did meet with uh, Mr. McManus and and with most of you guys out there too. Um, and I don't, uh, you know, I think this one is is usually a, it's an easy one to agree on or or to quite you know to to ask for additional um, additional information, but uh, this one wasn't that e easy for me. Uh, probably beyond my capabilities, in fact. Uh, so um, the commission had questions. I think the they went the right way. Um, I think the commission has uh, two. You know, from what I can see down the road. Uh, two options if the if the applicant uh, I'm sorry if this third party generally agrees with Mr. McManus uh, then there's really no question uh, if there's a difference then we we will have to come to some kind of an agreement or some kind of resolution so um, I think uh, although the applicant requested that I meet out there with with uh, Mr. Cole uh, Mr. Ian Cole um, on the day that he's doing his um, his his check, I was uh, I have to say I'm a little reluctant to do that. I think I think it would be better for him to um, just see it without anybody's uh, you know additional input. I told him what I saw out there and what we all saw out there, um, and what the commission is you know is looking for. So um, once the uh, you know once that. Uh, 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 Second, second opinion has been has been rendered. Then we can, I think, you know, like I said, either either it, it's it's a, a mute point, a moot point, or we can figure out a way to to uh, resolve the you know the small differences. Um, these wetlands, as you guys saw, uh, are flagged. Um, uh, you know where where there is uh, or was when we were all there earlier this spring where there's standing water. So that was really the, the biggest question. Um, and as you can see from the map, it's a lot different than our very inaccurate uh, wetlands map, official wetlands map. So that was another reason why I thought, um, you know, take a little closer look. So uh, that's pretty much it. Um, I, uh, um, I included a list of uh, plan revisions, uh, which I should not have included in your agenda package. Um, but uh, pretty much everything is here except for a few, you know, a few minor items. So there isn't a lot uh, to change on this plan. My uh, typical recommended conditions of approval are, are you know, or will be, I assume, once, once this is resolved. Um, typical for this one as well. So okay. that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right. Is there anybody here from the public? Let's see what we got here. Nobody from the public. All right. Any question from the commissioners? Anybody? All right. Um, any... So I guess we should close the public hearing right there. I mean, uh, table it till the next meeting. Yeah, I, I, I want to say one, one thing. I, I do agree with uh, with Mr. Castaldi's um, thought process that I, I, I don't think that, you know, if an independent, if another 
party comes out to independently assess the wetlands, it's not appropriate for anyone to have any influence or <laughs> suggestions in the field as to where where a wetland may or may not be. So I think it's most appropriate for the person to go out on their own, um, just you know, as if it was a new project and just see what they need to do. Okay, great. Yeah, so I, I think you're right, Alan. If there aren't any questions or comments from the commission then, or any more comments, I should say, then uh, the right thing to do would be to uh, table. table the application and continue the public hearing to the May 16th meeting. And that's till what meeting? Um, May 16th. May 16th. Okay. All right. Is there a motion to table the public hearing until so moved. Made, made by Barry? Second okay. by Katie. Who was the second? That was Kevin. Ke Kevin Wilcox. Kevin Thank Wilcox? You. Oh, Katie smiled, but I smiled. <laughs> oh, geez. All right. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? It's unanimous. So it's table till May 16th. Uh, second item on the agenda is the same principles. Now, the only question I have from this, Peter, is how can we act we can't act on the second one either because we don't have the first one this is correct so why are we you want to hear it now the well I, I think that yes i think it would be appropriate to open the public hearing and and hear a preliminary presentation from from the applicant uh, for the same reasons that i spoke before if there are any questions now is the, now is the time to to you know hear okay. them Commit, uh, sorry, questions from the commission in particular. Right. Um, is there a motion to open the public hearing for item number two? Can I so ask moved. a question first? Sure. Will the applicant be able to submit any new information if we open it tonight and then yes. table it? As long as it's not closed. Yeah, yeah. Okay. as long as we don't close it. Right, that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, is there a motion to open a public hearing for the application for a permit for Douglas Street Ventures LLC for 59 and 60 Douglas Street? So moved. Who motion said that? Made. The motion was made. Who made it? I think I made it and Katie seconded it, or Kevin seconded it. Okay. Kevin. No, that was that was to close the last one. This is opening a new I'm one. Sorry, I apologize. Oh. Yeah. Okay. You may, you may I, I, I will do it. Kevin will. Alan, Alan, yeah. I make the motion. Okay. Kevin made the motion. Second. I'll second it. Fair. Very good. I guess so. Joyce can have it on record. She can't always tell who's talking. Um. Okay. So who's here for the app? Okay. Same uh, people. Is Peter, I'm on mute. Yep. No, you're not. I'm not, right. no, okay. Peter DeMalley, President of Design Professionals here on behalf of Douglas Street Ventures, LLC, the applicant. How come we can't, oh, Daniel? He's, he's, he's on Peter Daniel's DeMalley. computer, but his name is Peter. We're he's using the same computer. Yeah, Peter DeMalley. Peter DeMalley, and I'm president of the company and Daniel Jameson will be following me. And then Jim McManus from JMM, uh, wetlands will be following Daniel. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you very yep. much. And, and this is the same thing. Um, we don't need a history of the site. We just want to know what's there, what you're doing, and how you're going to protect the wetlands. Okay. I, I will give an abbreviated version. Uh, brevity is a word. So uh, let me just get to the chase right now. Uh, we're on the westerly side of, uh, of Douglas Street, uh, just north of Britain Drive. Uh, and well south of Cottage Grove Road. Uh, you already know the area. Do you want me to, to find the area what's near there? No, we know no, where it is. No need to do that. Okay, great. We'll skip right to the chase. Um, so we're proposing a 74,520 square foot uh, warehouse and distribution center building uh, at the northeast corner of the site. 
uh, and we will be uh, combining 59, is that 69th of South? Yeah, 59 uh, Douglas Street, which is to the north, and then to the south is 69 Douglas Street. Uh, those two properties be combined. It's roughly eight point, you know, it's eight, just over 8.7 acres in size. Uh, we will be proposing along with this uh, 74,520 square foot building, uh, we'll be proposing 72 auto spaces on the southerly side of it, uh, of the building immediately uh, serving the uh, employees and guest parking. Uh, 20 on the west side of the building will be 20 loading docks. And that's facing away from Douglas Street in the back of the building uh, with additional 32 auto spaces to the west, extreme west side of the property, uh, west of the loading dock uh, maneuvering, maneuvering area. We're also provo providing at the southerly end of the site, uh, 55 trailer parking spaces, uh, which will be connected to the loading dock by a 30 foot wide uh, two-way access driveway. Uh, we have three curb cuts proposed on Douglas Street, one at the northeast corner, which is uh, which will be only ingress for uh, for trucks. Uh, and then in the middle of the site, uh, we're going to have one which is exclusively for right here. Thank you. Uh, exclusively for the uh, parking uh, for the employees and guests. Uh, and then a, a, a third uh, egress point, ingress and egress point is a driveway, two way access driveway serving the trailer storage area and all vehicle, all truck vehicles will be exiting from the loading dock air, loading court area through that 30 foot drive and out through the, um, through the uh, trailer area uh, to uh, Douglas Street. So we've covered that um, and just to wrap up this part of it, um, we have some, uh, Jim McManus will be describing the wetlands uh, he already mentioned where they were, but what we're doing uh, with respect to those. And then of course, so we're creating some uh, wetlands as well. Uh, and he will get into that. And why don't I just turn it over to uh, Daniel Jameson, our project manager and licensed professional engineer to discuss uh, some of the engineering aspects of the proposal so that we don't uh, keep too long. Daniel's coming over. Thank you, Peter. Good evening, members of the, the commission. For the record, my name is Daniel Jameson, a project manager at Design Professionals and Professional Engineer in the state of Connecticut. I'm here today to discuss site drainage and um, erosion control. Um, just a, a little bit on why we uh, look at the property and the watersheds on site. Um, there is an existing ridge line that um, exists on site, separating flow, um, surface water flow from uh, stuff that would make it to the western boundary line and another portion of the property that would um, enter into the Douglas Street existing storm collection system. Um, both all this water from the site though, however, is a part of the local basin um, watershed as defined by the CT um, Eco uh, website uh, created by Yukon, um, which basically states that or has a local basin watershed ID uh, number 4404-12 for waters draining to the north branch of the Park River. Um, so although we, uh, although all of the site does drain to the Park River, we maintained existing flows to just the western boundary line uh, with our proposed um, detention um, system, storm management system for the two, 10, 25, 50, and 100 year storm events. Uh, for the basin, the basin will be uh, zoom in on the site plan right now. Uh, for the proposed uh, basin, is going to be a, a tiered, dry basin system. Uh, we have an upper basin here that will collect runoff from the truck loading or truck parking area, yeah. uh, trailer area, and um, connecting drive, uh, which will be uh, detained in an upper uh, basin. Uh, it will be dry because there will be a pipe at the bottom that will convey uh, that detained flow to a lower basin uh, at the uh, western, northwesternmost corner of the site, uh, which will collect and uh, detain water, uh, of course, the water that is released from the upper basin, but also uh, from the loading dock area and these uh, auto parking spaces uh, around the proposed building uh, for final detention and an outlet control structure, ultimately to release 
at the uh, northwesternmost corner of the site where it will flow on to the town of Bloomfield's property um, and make it to an uh, intersecting uh, swale as it does uh, today. Um, for, uh, for water quality, we are proposing four or three, I'm sorry, water quality units, one here, one for flow from the uh, connecting drive and one to treat flows from the uh, trailer parking area. Um, those three water are hydrodynamic separators, water quality units that are hydrodynamic separators uh, were, were sized to uh, treat 80% of the total suspended solids um, based on uh, water quality flow calculation um, as recommended in the 2004 Connecticut Water Quality Manual. Uh, so those three water quality units will ensure all or well, 80% of the sediment is removed from all stormwater prior to being discharged to the basin. Um, since they won't, it will not have a wet bottom, it will be a dry bottom basin. Um, uh, we did receive some comments from the town engineer about the basin and its in, and the impact of the basins uh, or impact of the basin on the hydrology of our proposed wetland area and uh, enhancement area or mitigation area. And um, we we will work with the town engineer um, to ensure that we are adequately hydrating the existing wetland and our enhanced our mitigation area. Um, we currently have surface area that will drain to the basin, but um, we, we have means to send more water there uh, from clean roof runoff. Um, if seen fit by in our discussions with the town engineer and uh, we, um, we're, we're more than happy to, to work that out with him. Um, but at this point, just to talk a little bit more about this wetland mitigation area, uh, there's two, there are existing, three existing wetland pockets on site. Um, these two pockets will be uh, disturbed with the trailer parking area and um, the, the, with the proposed project. Uh, so in order to mitigate that air, we are proposing at a rate of 1.6 to 1 uh, a proposed mitigation area adjacent to this existing wetland pocket that will remain undisturbed. Um, we did account, well, we, we will have to reshape the mid the enhancement area um, after we get final confirmation from Ian. Um, we'll rework this area to ensure that we stay at that rate of 1.6 to 1. Um, this dotted line shows the change based off of uh, Jim McManus's relocated flags as he was discussing um, in the, in the um, preceding presentation. Um, the plantings that will go in the mitigation area are wet and dry tolerant planting that are native to um, this area. Um, for uh, erosion control, uh, all erosion controls were designed and sized um, based off of recommendations made in the 2002 Connecticut guidelines for soil erosion uh, control. Uh, for temporary erosion control measures, there will be silt fence provided at the downhill slope of all disturbance and up the sides of the banks where there could be potential disturbed or um, sediment runoff to adjacent properties. Well, let me just pull this up. Um, as shown here, uh, we are proposing uh, diversion swells as well to ensure that we route disturbed areas to two proposed temporary sediment traps um, that will serve as a temporary holding point uh, for a runoff or, um, to allow for sediment to filter out. Um, construction access will occur uh, to the southern end of the site for the trailer park loaded or trailer access, trailer parking area, um, and also at the standard auto parking area. We're providing uh, proposing two construction accesses, and um, there will be temporary stock files will be used and relocated as needed um, to accommodate construction. Uh, for our catch basins in the road, we will be providing for or proposing temporary inlet protection. A filter fabric to be installed on those grates to ensure that no sediment makes it into those basins and continues on downstream. And um, for permanent control, also we there will be hay bales proposed at all outfalls um, to finish off the temporary erosion control measures. And then for permanent erosion control measures, we did size uh, riprap aprons and preformed scour holes based off of the 2002 erosion and sedimentation control guidelines. Um, we did get a comment from Peter Castaldi about the fact that, yes, we this water was allowed to sheet flow across this western boundary line, and now we are going to be uh, kind of 
isolating it and concentrating it at this um, northwestern corner. And uh, we did look excuse at me, that. And excuse me, I, Daniel, can you, sorry, just slow down? can you just slow down a little bit, please? Talk I'm sorry, I, no problem, sir. Thank no you. Problem. Yes, so would you, would you like me to repeat anything, Mr. Chair? No, no, it's just I was doing great. Down. Just talk a little slower, please. Got you, man. So we are um, going to be, we did get a comment from Peter Castaldi uh, about how we are going to now be concentrating all of our outflow uh, from our proposed tiered basin to the northwest corner of the site here. And I did look at that and we also included this specific preformed scour hole in our water, in our um, hydrocat or stormwater model, just to see what the velocity of that flow would be leaving this preformed scour hole. And based off of the uh, fine sandy um, loam condition or soils on site, as indicated in the um, USDA NRCS uh, soil survey that we generated and submitted with our storm drainage report, and also based on site observations for myself and um, fellow colleagues uh, of the soil types out there. We feel that the uh, 1.2 feet per second or 1.3 feet per second that will occur in the 10 year storm will be uh, below the erosion, uh, erosion potential zone um, as uh, or illustrated in the Hillstrom diagram which is a diagram on uh, that shows average erosive velocities for um, different particle sizes. So with that, we feel that this area, yes, although it will be concentrated and will run over the property line at that point, it will flow over at a rate that will not cause any impact to the downstream area. With that, I will turn it over to Jim McManus to um, discuss our impacts to wetland areas and um, yeah, Jim, take it from there. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Jim McManus again, uh, JMM Wetland Consulting Services. I mentioned uh, on the previous application, I was there on April 8th, 2021, and again on August 4th to delineate the three isolated forested swamps. Um, they all have some sort of disturbance, but the, the bottom two have significant disturbance and, and the, what I called my bee wetland, which is the further south, is actually uh, uh, sort of ponds more water than it probably would in, it, it, than it would due to the being built up from the neighboring property to the south. Uh, it sort of burned it up a little bit, but anyways, uh, that's about it. We had three, uh, three wooded swamps, all isolated, uh, no, no pipes or anything noted. And then again, on that, <clears throat> against the Western property line, it was a small bit that uh, entered onto the site in that Western line. Uh, we didn't actually do a function and value assessment. They, uh, actually these wetlands are too small especially the two Southern ones uh, to be used by the Army Corps descriptive approach, which is the highway methodology. However, they do have some minor functions, uh, mainly wildlife habitat, I guess one would say. Uh, there is some nutrient removal. They do, they do collect water because they are depressional areas. Uh, other than that, they're just sort of remnant wooded swamps that probably from old agricultural use. As Daniel said, they're proposing a warehouse with associated parking and such. And we do have a direct impact of uh, about 2,282 square feet, about 0 0.052 acres of uh, isolated disturbed wooded swamp areas for mainly due for parking and some driveway areas. Uh, so that's that. And then we also look at indirect impacts, which are related to uh, short-term and long-term impacts from uh, water quality and habitat and from erosion and sediment control and other things that we're gonna go through right now. Uh, 
The first thing we look at is during the construction phase, which is the erosion and sediment control. Uh, we're confident that we won't have an impact due to the detailed sediment erosion control plan that was just described. The on-site soils are sort of moderately erosive and proposed development is gently on is proposed is relatively gentle sloping. So it's not, we don't have large steep slopes that we're gonna have to contend with. Uh, removal of native vegetation and habitat loss is uh, another indirect impact that we look at. And uh, the, we did our best we could with the remaining isolated wetland that is going to be here or, or not going to be filled. Um, we are protecting some wooded area. Obviously, the offsite area is still wooded. We're, we're having a robust uh, in, uh, mitigation plan that will uh, that's going to be uh, implemented. So, uh, in that regard, you know, it's a disturbed small area, anyways. But I think with that, we should uh, that wetland will still function, hopefully, better than it did before with the addition of additional plants, because right now it's pretty, as you probably remember from your site walk, there's not a lot going on out there on the ground. It's pretty bare. Uh, we also look at hydrology impacts and stream flow. Uh, these wetlands are contribute to shallow groundwater and surface flows. And as Daniel mentioned, uh, the watershed to the east is going to remain, but we probably cut off a little bit to the west. However, we can add additional roof runoff to ensure that this area does continue to maintain its current hydrology and not only the plants that are in the wetland, but the mitigation area will thrive. So that's already been discussed by the team and can be, and can be done. Water quality impacts is Another thing that we look at, and uh, I won't even talk much about that. Daniel kind of went through it. We're using a best management practice formal stormwater management program to take care of all our runoff to not impact not only the on site wetlands, but the downgrading and off site wetlands to the west. In my report that was dated on February 28th, it mentions that uh, the, roughly a 3,600 square foot wetland habitat will be developed. Obviously it's gonna be a little bit bigger or it's gonna be altered because those numbers may change. It's changed once already and it may change again, depending on what Mr. Cole determines uh, that the wetlands to be. But again, Daniel and I, we talked about it. We have a robust planting plan. If you look at the, your plan set, you'll see uh, the, the, the site planting, which includes the wetlands. And uh, so with diligent monitoring during the construction phase, uh, we certainly don't anticipate any um, significant adverse uh, short or long-term impacts upon these regulated resources, which include offsite uh, downstream resources to the West. Thank you. Okay, uh, Peter. Yeah, uh, Mr. James, can we get um, uh, some more different site plans or do you have the planting plan? Yeah. Well, while, while he's looking for this, um, the, uh, uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about, I'll talk about this. Uh, you know, it, it, it looks like a pretty good, uh, planting plan as far as the, the mitigation area uh, goes. But um, I think I, if this goes forward as shown or similar to this, I would recommend maybe some additional planting uh, actually in the wetlands, uh, as well as um, any invasive um, species removal. Um, but uh, that's what's proposed. So it's kind of close to the, to the road, most of the plant labels are in the connecting driveway there. Um, but the, uh, uh, you know, rest of the area, I guess, uh, the other three sides, uh, most of the most of the existing veg vegetation is going to remain uh, within, you know, within uh, um, 
a certain uh, a certain distance. Um, can we see the uh, the lay? I think it's the layout plan that shows those um, upland review areas and vegetated buffer zones. Yes, we'll be doing that. Yep. So the 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 plans indicate two uh, two phases. Uh, the large building and the parking around it is the first phase. And the second phase is the, the additional um, trailer parking uh, in the south. Uh, and uh, all of the direct wetland impacts are for the trailer parking in the south. Uh, so, um, you know, one of the, here we go, one of the, uh, uh, one of the things uh, for the for the applicant to uh, to present uh, is is prudent and feasible alternatives, and one of the alternatives in my mind has to be not to build the southerly parking lot. That would eliminate the wetland impacts altogether. Um, that may not be uh, prudent from the developer's point of view, um, but there are other ways to you know reduce or or eliminate. Uh, wetland impacts, um, but the uh, you know the uh, the applicant can uh, request and get permission uh, to get uh, up to sixty percent impervious coverage on the site. Uh, this site is kind of funny shaped with the uh, existing. Uh, yeah, could I ask you to zoom out? Thank you. But there's an existing residential lot in the middle. So that kind of restricts, you know, a, a more efficient, uh, less wetland impact to uh, kind of a development. So uh, my recommendation is that the applicant take a look at possibly illuminating or reducing the wetland impacts as well as, uh, you know, if you reduce those, you're going to reduce the impacts to the upland review areas. Uh, and the and the vegetated buffer, um, what you know, what the applicant uh, decides to do uh, with uh, with those recommendations, or if they want to um, discuss, uh, you know, maybe discuss some of their thinking on the project that way, then you know, we we uh, we may be able to get a little bit more information. But I I think a uh, um, a, uh, a more formal um, um, analysis of the prudent and feasible alternatives is, is appropriate for this one. Um, so as you said earlier, Alan, without, uh, without the wetlands map amendment approval, this application can't be approved uh, or go forward. So I'm recommending the same thing, uh, tabling the application and continuing the public hearing to the May 16th meeting. Okay. Thank um, you, Mr. Chair. All right. So there's no questions from the public. Um, let's take some questions from the commission and then we can table it. Any questions from the commission? I have a couple. I have. Yep. Uh, okay. David? Okay. All right. The, um, I'm talk of the, uh, for the, um, the basins, the detention basins. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, you mentioned that they were to be dry basins. Um, can you talk about the elevation of the bottom of the basin versus the elevation of uh, groundwater on site? Because uh, it was also mentioned that we have shallow groundwater. Uh, Daniel's, uh, we're reversing positions. Daniel's coming in. Yes. Hello, David. Hello. Yes, sir. So um, in the area where the basin will be, yeah, just um, the bottom of basin is along uh, for the lower pond uh, to the northwest corner. Um, that will be the deeper, the deepest, uh, deeper of the two. Um, we're proposing a bottom of 106.5. Um, that grade in that area is um, 115. So almost a nine foot or yeah, nine foot cut. Um, and then for the basin on the southerly side of the site, 
Uh, we're going down to 108.5 uh, to one, and then 115 is about the uh, average existing grade there too, so. Okay, so, so if we're assuming that groundwater is in some cases, say within even 12 inches of the surface, um, how are you gonna maintain the dry bottom for your basin? So our design approach, um, We've um, we basically anticipate that this the bottom the outlet at the bottom will control groundwater uh, uh, during off storm event times, so that during a storm event uh, there will be available storage in the basin uh, to allow the next storm event to fill the basin up because we are utilizing the full basin volume um, and we put those orifices there's a the two flared ends that are proposed are proposed at the bottom of the basin. Uh, to ensure that we, we, it does have the ability to drain. Um, there is no wet, proposed wet pool volume. All right, so, so basically you're expecting this to be constantly flowing and just draining the groundwater like all the time? It will be maintaining groundwater uh, just as like a foundation drain would on the house. Um, it will work as a curtain drain. Uh, and at some point when the final, uh, groundwater condition settles after construction um as said yes the this area will not be receiving surface water as it does today so i would expect that it, it will stop once it reaches an equilibrium but yes there during when this basin is just installed uh we will need to there will be dewatering will need to be done uh to get the basin constructed to the elevation proposed uh and in doing so uh yes the, it will run for a momentary moment, but we fully expect that just as a, a curtain drain would, I mean, different than a curtain drain, we're basically capping this site with impervious. So all of our, uh, so our area for potential for um, interception to the groundwater table will occur, I mean, in our wetland area that to remain our grass and lawn areas around and our basin area. But um, the, we, we expect that at some point because of the impervious we're putting on site, it will prevent that groundwater from flowing um, once an equilibrium is reached. Okay. Um, the, one of the first graphics that you showed was the uh, the drainage basin map. Can you yes. pull that up again? So this is my proposal. I'm sorry. It, it, it's messing with me. I'm sorry, guys. Okay. G Y want to go to the next one. Uh, my discrete dot to top. Okay, there it goes. Now it's going away. Okay, here we are. Sorry, team. All right. So, so uh, am I correct that that's a triple basin on site, a triple drainage? Um, it is a triple drainage, but because my proposed condition intercepts this existing condition boundary line here, yeah, my basin intercepts that whole property line. Yeah, and so I, I did model this as two watersheds, both with their own time of concentrations and peak flows. Uh, in my hydrocotton model, I combined it, I combined those and I, I met that existing flow at this top right corner. Okay, so um so if we're if all of the for the for the um the basins, if there's one point of out if there's one outlet at the north corner, um then we're intercepting the water from the southern drainage basin that would have gone somewhere else. Um, so we're changing offsite hydrology by doing so. Uh, is that correct? Um, tech, we will be rerouting the direction of water, but as I was stating in, in my original presentation, this watershed, we're, we're a part of a 988 uh, acre watershed, the local basin ID that I, what, what, uh, for the North Park, North branch of the Park River. Uh, right. So our eight acre site is a part of a 988 acre watershed that all drains from east. I think it starts at uh, Blue Hills uh, at the utmost end and it drains all the way west. This is the a tributary stream that crosses, um, if I had a bigger map, you'll, it'll show it going across, going towards Granby. Um, crossing underneath the, the park adjacent to Granby Street and um, kind of popping out underneath the, um, I know it as Bowles Park, but the old uh, housing complex yeah. to meet the North Park Branch River Basin. 
Um, yeah. So I would say, although yes, we are redirecting it, this water will end up in the same tributary in that same North Branch River um, as it does. Maybe uh, this area where we won't be sending the surface flow to this facility's drainage system as it does today. I'm sure they will probably be happy about that. The pallet manufacturing, the pallet manufacturing company. Um, so this, their property line will now have no sheet flow going across it. And all of our sheet flow will occur uh, across the town's property now or town owned property. Um, and it'll meet this swell, which is also in the town owned property. It also, it actually bisects the property. So it, we're not proposing that to spill onto any um, neighbors uh, besides the, the town's property to, to make it to that swell. Right, so I, well, I guess, yeah, so you're talking about regional drainage basins and I'm looking at sub-regional. Um, yeah. So, you know, when you look at the, the, when you sort of zoom in on that, that consideration, you know, while you are reducing volume that goes to one property, you're increasing the volume that goes to another property. Um, and, you know, it's hard to make an assumption that somebody would be happy or not happy about more or less water. Um, so I guess my concern was that, you know, you, you've got to, you have two constructed basins um, and you've got them sort of daisy chains so that they both go to the same outlet location. Um, had you put any consideration into not having them connected and having them with two separate outlets so that you maintain flow within the sub-regional drainage basin? Um, without totally, I'll, I'll pull up my um, proposed drainage area. Uh, without disturbing this wetland pocket, uh, the reason why we did the tiered approach is because the property spans from um, elevation 129 at this property line at the Douglas Street. And along this portion of the property, you see we well, have elevations like 113 and uh, 114. So, but then when I come across, when I look north and I get to the western corner of the site, I drop down to 105. So, it, if I kept the basin at the same elevation all the way and kept one bank, I wouldn't have been able to utilize the upper storage level of this upper basin. So it was advantageous for me to uh, berm this up so I can use from the 108 to a 104 elevation of volume, have these ponds daisy chained together. And then I was also able to use this volume of the lower basin um, that will fill up as well, both to ensure that we have one foot of freeboard in a hundred year storm for both basins as they work together. And then finally make it out to the area of uh, basically we, we would say least um, just our, be an area where least potential for activity um, and still provide to send the water and the direction or in the location, this swell that it would get to today. Yes, probably upstream, but still along the same watershed channel or along the same water course. Right, yeah, so I guess, you know, my, my concern here is that we're um, changing uh, offsite conditions. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that that's a that that's a, a considered thought. Um, you talked about the velocity um, not being erosive. Uh, yes. Can you talk about the the volume uh, change, um, or you know, I don't either yes. increasing or decreasing? Well, there will definitely be an increase in volume um, as this the area yes will be capped as impervious. Um, and as regulations go, we're always, the, the requirement is that we match peak flows um, and we evaluate the impact of volume. And based off of, I mean, from where we're outletting at this, yes, concentrated spot point source uh, discharge, um, we, we're outletting that to the same area and uh, the, the rate that we are gonna be uh, allow or that it will be flowing over will be less. So that volume that will be more, it'll be drawn out over a longer time period so that the energy uh, of the water is maintained to existing conditions and we won't have any, um, or we won't be sending any more, en or any more potential for erosion in our proposed condition than there was in the existing condition. Okay. Um, I wanna talk about the, the culvert that you have going under the access road. Yes, sir. Um, 
the um, I guess the my question is about the placement of that culvert. Um, if I look at the the delineated wetland, um, it sort of points to a different spot, um, which would make me think that that's sort of where the water might want to go. Um, but your culvert is north of that. Um, is there going to be a change in topography to accommodate for that? You're talking about this culvert here. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it, it looks weird. We we wanted to ensure that this wetland could pocket up with water. So what we did was we set um, this orf or this outlet control structure uh, with the grate that was set probably uh, just a slightly below the curb line here, just so that this water, the elevation here or the, the the water that enters the wetland is allowed to pool up, um, and then it would enter in first the grate. Uh, and then be conveyed to the upper pond uh, for all storms underneath the 10 year storm. Then in the 10 year storm, it was allowed to spill over. Uh, any storm above the 10 year storm, it will spill over um, and enter the basin that way. Um, so that it's not, we don't, we, we never uh, force the inundation onto the neighboring residential property. Um, so that's, that's why it's kind of just floating out there like that. It will be a, basically a riser structure um, that will allow for a temporary pooling of water. Uh, in the created wetland area or expanded wetland area. Um, and then also a release point that will be uh, the curb um, so that we don't back water up onto our neighbor's property. Okay. Um, is, the, um, is the whole site other than, uh, well, how, how much is gonna be clear cut on site? Um, it is, as we all know, it's, a, it's the entire thing's a wooded <laughs> site. And yeah, obviously yeah. for the, the building and the parking and the access road, um, the trees have to be cut. But there's, um, you know, there's a significant amount of trees out there. Um, how much is going to be to remain? Is there is there a graphic or can you point on the? Um, the exist, this site plan kind of the, this exhibit shows it well. Um, okay. We will be clearing. I mean, to get our grade here, we're going to be dropping down from the existing grade in this area. So this will end up being a lawn area. Um, to the south of the proposed building. Uh, we will be regrading around this wetland area here. So that'll force that to be some type of lawn area. Um, but uh, this area to remain here will remain uh, wooded, uh, the same existing natural uh, vegetation. Um, so there will be a little pocket up at the at Douglas Street that will remain. But um, yeah, this, this exhibit shows well is mainly the portion directly adjacent to the existing wetland, as um, Jim mentioned, will, will be the, the areas that will remain with the existing wood vegetation. Okay. Yeah, my, my, my line of questioning there is that um, it was mentioned that the some of the minimal functions and values that are provided by the wetland are wildlife habitat. Um, and while the wetland footprint itself will remain, you know, there's going to be a significant reduction of overall habitat without easy overland access to other offsite wetlands. Um, so I, my, my concern is that we're really just eliminating or greatly reducing that function of, the, of whatever wetland remains. I um, wanted to ask too about the, the, um, the planting plan within the mitigation site. Yes, um, sir. Is it proposed to be wooded so that we're replacing some of our loss, or is it going to be scrub shrub or herbaceous? They will be scrub shrub. Hold on, let me grab the landscaping plan so I can tell you exactly what we're proposing there, Dave. Um, they will be, yes, please. You know what? I will go back to the landscaping plan as well so you can see. So in this area, so these will be shrub plants. Um, those consist of uh, brilliant red chokeberry, uh, compact juniper, uh, northern bayberry, highbush blueberry, arrow vibram, and American cranberry brush. And those plantings were selected because of their native nature to this, to this area and because they, uh, some are wet tolerant and some are, uh, what is the word? 
wets are normally found in basins but or in wetland areas, but also can be in dry areas. So that's why these shrubs are selected. And then directly around the wetland area, I mean, not technically a part of the enhancement, but will also serve as a, you know, habitat and potential place where uh, wildlife could uh, make, make home, have, uh, could reside, would be in the proposed plantings around both the trailer parking area to the south and our standard parking area uh, directly south of the proposed building. Uh, we are proposing uh, trees in that, uh, some trees around those areas there. Um, so yes, definitely nowhere near as much wooded area on site uh, with the, the proposed development, but we are uh, doing, making our best effort to provide back a, a sufficient area that will uh, function as the existing wetlands on site did. Okay, so when, when the uh, mitigation site is to be constructed, are all the trees that are there now going to be cut down so that shrubs can be planted? Yes, we will. We will be. We will have to be. Re, there, there will be a regrade of this area to rework it. So yes, the existing trees within this area will be um, removed, and then the wetland seed mix, which uh, will provide a, a good metal type of uh, uh, wetlands uh, grass or tall grass um, potential for or that'll be the, the grass that will grow up, and then these uh, the, the shrubs will be planted as well too. So. You know, over time, Mother Nature will retake its course. But yes, we we will we are proposing clearing of that area first um, to provide the wetland enhancement or wetland mitigation area. Okay, so yeah, so I, I know we don't have different ratios for different types of mitigation, um, but I know you know, for example, Army Corps gives a higher ratio for wooded mitigation versus shrub shrub versus emergent. Mm -hmm. um, for a variety of reasons. And it, it seems that um, putting a scrub shrub mitigation area to compensate for loss of wooded wetlands, um, it, it doesn't seem as valuable um, in, in certain ways. I, obviously it, it, it does provide different types of value, um, but you know, it's, it's, it doesn't seem to be a direct compensatory mitigation for the impacts of the project. Um, all right, oh, I got one more and then, then I'll turn it over. Um, for the, uh, the impacts in the parking area um, uh, to the south, um, you know, I, I, I agree with Peter about um, discussion of fe feasible and prudent alternatives. Um, can you speak to um, the necessity of the number of parking spaces uh, because it, it seems, it seems like it would be feasible to shift the entrance to that parking area to the north end, and then reduce the number of parking spaces on the west side of the parking lot, so that we could greatly reduce our impacts to the wetlands. Yes, yeah, so I can comment on that. Um, the the access drive was actually set in this location. Uh, one, oh, to I'm keep... sorry, I'm sorry, on, on the west side, the west side. Oh, of that, the west saying, side of that, yeah, where oh, the wetlands yeah. are. The west side of that, that park, the lower parking lot, the south parking lot. You're saying if we could relocate this drive? It, well, I mean, I, I don't know if you need the numbers or not, but it seems that if that drive just came in just at the north corner of that parking lot, right, right where the hand is, well, okay, got you, got right here. Um, if it came in, no, 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 just, yeah, right there. Oh, could, I see what you're saying. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then, and then traveled along north of the wetlands. And then the parking lot started just to the east of the wetlands. That would eliminate those direct impacts. Okay. Um, but I don't know if that messes with your numbers. And, you know, that's why the feasible and prudent, prudent alternative discussion should happen. So basically, shorten the parking area. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'll let yeah, we'll we'll, we'll we'll review that with Mr. McManus, Mr. Castali, and uh, Daniel Jamison uh, during the intervening period. Uh, we'll take a sorry about that out of view. Um, we'll we'll take a look at that. Um, 
in terms of what what measures we may employ to to reduce the impacts uh let's look at that we the site like this does need um adequate number of uh, trailer spaces um this is what we've been advised uh this number we can look at reducing it um to see if we can further reduce the impacts be glad to take a look at that um and uh, with our client uh Stephen Levesque uh, who owns the uh uh, one of the manufacturing enterprise around the corner. Uh, and so we'll, we'll review that with him uh, in terms of uh, reducing impacts. So let's see what we can do and still have a viable site. Uh, they need to have trailer parking on the site uh, to have it um, on a, a separated, completely separate from the other one will great, greatly reduce what we can do in terms of the development, uh, in terms of the marketplace. So that's one reason we didn't do that. We have to have them interconnected. Uh, and this is really where we need to have uh, the um, egress for the trucks. Uh, we, it's a one-way entrance on the north side of the building because you want to have trucks as best you can. Um, you know, when they're backing in, they don't have blind back up into the loading dock spaces. So we'll take a look at that, see if we can reduce the impacts. Uh, we'll work with our client. We'll work with uh, um, Mr. McManus uh, and our engineering staff and also uh, town staff to see what we can come up with to try to further reduce the impacts. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I've any taken other, up, I've taken up enough time. I'll let any other over to questions from the. Uh, Thank you for your input, Mr. Leopoldo. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I have a few questions actually. Can uh, you hear me? Yep. Kevin is saying, go ahead. Yeah, I too, like um, David, have a lot of concerns about a drainage. I um, I don't think I don't know. Um, I think what you need to do. I know there's a couple sections. For your next presentation, I, I think you should go back to your graded plan and cut sections in, in, in the property in that area. Let's see specifically what some of those um, sections look like, especially right around where the basins are and stuff like that. I, I, I too have some concerns about your drainage. I know and I agree that um, I agree you're saying you're meeting or meeting the existing outfall based on your cash. And I'm sure you've walked the site to um, Dan, Danielle, I think. Dan, Dan, what's your existing flow right now? What's the requ What's the existing flow? Uh, I can pull that up for you, my phone. Two seconds. I know you said you're right now, your 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 flow right now is 1.3 CFS going out on a 10 year storm, but what's your. If you'll bear with me for two seconds, I'm just pulling up my peeps now. Okay. So I will share. All right. So this is my peak flows section of my drainage report. And Kevin, just to correct you, that was a 1.3 feet per second, the velocity okay. leaving my preformed scour hole uh, for the 10 year storm. Okay. But um, as you see here, the Western, the combined effect of um, the Western boundary lines condition, we achieved a net reduction for every storm event. Um, okay. What my concern is that that existing swale right now is literally, um, I don't even know if you want to call it a swale. There's tons of stuff that's happening in that area. We walked that area. There are tree trunks in there. There's tons of stuff going on in that area. I honestly think that You'd probably have to also work with the town of Bloomfield and make sure that that swale from there all the way to the north branch of the Park River conduit is clear up and, and or because there's tons of debris in there. There's a lot of stuff that can create problems for your your. I too like. I, I also don't like the fact that I, I know you're. I understand what you're trying to do and you're trying to break up drainage. But I take a look at probably see if you can have the um, areas flow separately if you can and or mitigate that northwest um, with the town how, how that swale that it's going to be going into because I th I think there's going to be a lot of um, concerns there so and I didn't know I didn't know David spoke about it so I'm not going to take too much time going back to that low point catch basin though all right on the gradient plan go back to the gradient plan that low point catch basin that David mentioned that was one of my notes your um if you go back to your gradient plan. This guy here? Yeah. Um, if you go to the one that has your top of frame elevation. Yes, let me uh, pull it out. Oh. Your, top of, your top of frame elevation is about seven or six inches higher than the low point. And I think that's what David was mentioning. 
So you're going to have a puddle below that catch basin before it even flows into the catch basin. So you, not that, go to, go to page um, CGD1 or sheet number. Bear with me, Hassan. I'm uh, just pulling up our full site plan for you, man. So I yeah, think go to sheet number three. All right, got you, got you. All right, let me just pull up the full thing. Okay, and I'm going to resume share. Sheet number three. Okay, here we go. Yep. Yeah, just zoom into that that low point here where that catch basin is. Yep, yep. Yeah, you see your top of frame there is 115.66, and you have a low point there of 115. Yes, sir. That was done intentionally. Uh, sorry? That was done intentionally, uh, Mr. Uh, Kevin. That was done to um, ensure that this wetland pocket uh, has a stays has a potential to get six inches. I guess it's actually 0.43 uh, of bottom of curve, no top of curve will be higher. So yeah, it'll it'll get about six inches of water in that wetland area, and then it will spill over uh, into the outlet control or this grate, and then con convey its way to the uh, final outlet. Potential. Yeah, but it's eight, it's still eight inches higher than your low point of 115, which means it's going to have to wait for eight inches of water to build up before it starts to go into that 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 catch basin. Yes, now we can reduce that, and that's what we would want to work out um, with the town engineer, uh, Peter Castaldi, uh, with Jim McManus on our team, uh, to figure out to add what the best way to hydrate this wetland. Uh, we provided a means so that there is a potential for a pocket of water. If that pocket of water is too much water, we can lower this down. Um, this doesn't need to be at this elevation. All right, but just again revise that when you when you guys do your new site walk, walk and stuff like that. My other question: If you come a little bit south of the property line, that inner property line, come to yes. the um the existing property line for that current owner there. Come to the slope. Okay. Just, just come down a little. Come further south. Okay. Come a little bit more. Where that um where your slope, your four to one slope is right there, right in this area, right here. Keep going. Zoom into that area right there. Got you. Okay. Got you. Okay. Right. Uh, come yeah no 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 sorry come back out not, that's not, not that one keep coming back to the property line where the the owner the in the inner property line i'm sorry the other side of the inner, parking lot got you this guy but over in this area this four to one slope here no no keep going okay, right there right here look at the the um what's her name the other property line where these contours are right here yeah, yeah. that area right there yes Look between the curb and the property line where your parking is. Yes. You have a four to one slope there and you're starting at 122. Water lines travel perpendicular to contours. So yes. most of that water, even though you have a little slight swale there, may be flowing into their, your property, right? So okay. you need to, I think you need to reconfigure this area here because there might be some issues in that area there because that four to one slope, you're going almost, you know, four feet, you know, over one foot and then you're, you're going to create a problem there with our property lines. So if you back out back a little bit now, my yeah. question to you would be, why do you have a seven for these trailers? Do you need a 70 foot um, aisle, a drive aisle for these trailers? If you come out to your, come out to that trailer drive aisle, that's 70 foot between the parking st stalls. Yeah. For your turning radiuses, you need 70 foot or you don't need that 70 foot? Yeah, it's for the, um, so they can load up and then hitch. They have to hitch the trailer on because these are just, these spaces are only for the trailer, not the trailer and cabin. So they need that big area for maneuvering. Because what I was gonna say, reduce, if you, you pull that curb, pull that curb back line back and rework your contours there. So some of that doesn't flow into the other property or affect that drainage area in there. Because I think some of that, it may affect that other, your property, uh, uh, Miss Bailey's or Dora's, Dora Bailey's property because those contours are flowing right into that area. And it's pretty steep there. So I would shorten your drive aisle if you can use your turn in radius and probably pull back that curb line a little to flatten out those slopes a little bit so it flows into the wetlands area. Okay. Um, this staying stay with the same parking, this is also an entry and an exit, correct? Yes. So, and I know I know you're saying you want to make it a one way on the, the, the upper upper um, driveway, but I think if this is an entry and an exit and you can make the flow work, if you get rid of that north park and that entry, you can reduce a lot of the impervious, some impervious there, and reduce some of your 
drainage and stuff like and other stuff, you can probably, you know, reduce some of your outfall, your impervious. So I know you're trying to make it out, but I mean, I would consider you really need three driveways to get in and out of there, right? If it's going to help reduce your impervious and maybe some of your drainage and some of your, your other stuff. So I would look into that too. Um, the other quick thing I had was, um, I think that's it for now for all the wetlands stuff. So I'm good for now. Thank you. Anybody, Anybody else? Anybody but else get the sections cut. I'm sorry, Kevin. What? Kevin, you're good. Okay. Oh, you're good. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying. Remind. I just want to remind them then to get if you can get some section cuts. Yeah. For the, the that back swale and that drainage area, that'd be nice to see a little better. Hey, um, Alan. I uh, I have to report that I did meet with the MDC out on the site, uh, where some of the uh, some of the trees for their clearing program were were in the in the swale, uh, and they have agreed to come out and remove those trees um, from the swale, and they'll the uh, the downstream. Uh, this is all on the town property downstream right. of the outfall. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware that that's happening and that there was, uh, you know, there, there was a meeting. The commission asked me to try to get that meeting. So I had some, some of the MDC guys come out and take a look and they said, yeah, we'll take those. We'll take them out. They're not going to take them away, but they're going to take them out of this, out of the water course. Okay. All right. Any other questions? All right, I have a few questions. Um, I assume that um, 63 Douglas Street, which is the house in the middle, I, I assume they were notified of this project? Yes, yes. all butters have been notified. Okay. All right. And we submitted a certified mailing to Mr. Castello. Okay. Um, so the impact to their house, I'm concerned about the was it the north and the south side being built up and creating a pond where all the water theoretically is going to flow to the west? But if that uh, drainage pipe gets clogged, their water is going to be creeping up. Water is going to be creeping up their property. Elevation. And that's and yes, Adam. Just to answer your question, Mr. Chair, uh, that's why. Over. This perv is set at 159, or I'm sorry, 115.43. The top of that curve will be 115.9. Uh, the, the 116 contour is all remains on our property. So there's at no point, and even in my uh, my model, I show that our water surface elevation, um, I believe in the 100 year storm, will, will not pass uh, 116.15. Uh, so we will never reach that water, even in a hundred year storm event with this uh, self-induced inundation we're doing here to hydrate this wetland, we won't be puddling onto that neighboring property up to a hundred year storm event. Okay. Um, and in your final plans, you'll have uh, um, inspection schedule and a clean out schedule, uh, in schedule for that pipe? Yes, yes, there will be. Uh, oper or operation and maintenance um, okay. or instructions for this pipe. Yep. All right. As all attached All right. So the um, the drive through from one parking lot to the other. How wide is that road? That road is. Get... What well, well, this one here is yes. 30, 30 feet. Thirty feet wide. Yeah, it's for trucks. Right. Does that include um, any curbing or built up or just straight thirty feet? It'll be 30 feet plus the curb. So the curb will be six inches on either side. So with the curb, I guess you could call it 31 feet. Now, is that wide enough for two tractor trailers to pass at the same yes, time? Yes, that's standard. Yes. That's standard well, for it's, it's, it's a little close, isn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, it's 15, 15 yeah. feet on either side. That's a pretty that's wider than any lane out on the highways. Yeah, standard lanes are 12 feet wide. But right. in, internally, it's recommended. Uh, within a site to have 30 feet per when you have tractor semi trailer rigs, but we don't need we, we're not aware that we ever have to go wider than that. All right, I'm just concerned you're going to come back and say you need it bigger. No, um, no, 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 that's you don't want it bigger. <laughs> are, are these tractor trailers carrying is anything hazardous that if they do have an accident and tip over 
we we do not have the identified tenant for this. Uh, Mr. Levesque uh, and his uh, LLC are proposing to do this uh, right now, as it is right now. Uh, uh, they're, they're proposing this without a tenant identified. Um, we're preparing this so it's uh, marketable, so they can identify a tenant and occupy it. We do not know exactly who will be occupying the building at this time. Okay, so this is a spec building? As of right now, yes. Okay, all right. Um, do you, uh, in your final plan, will you have a list of uh, maintenance and schedule and chemicals used for uh, snow removal and ice and so forth? <coughs> Okay, we, yeah, we can provide that. All right. Um, and do, 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 where do you plan to store the snow when you plow? That's um, always a question that gets people. <laughs> yeah. Well, we do have the grass here or the grass area the adjacent to uh, the parking area. It is uphill of us on this side. Uh, that this area offers itself to some snow storage potential. That water would drain back into our system. Um, there's also additional grass area on the north side, the north side of this access drive. Um, we can we can look further at uh, snow storage and get back to you with a, a better plan next. Or, yeah, I mean, I don't want you pushing. I don't want you pushing out, pushing it over on 63's property. No. Um, do you have a concern if uh, if it gets pushed into the detention basin? Um, I would. Because um, the same water that runs off the surfaces will will get into the detention basin. I don't know. I'd have I'd have to defer to Peter on that one. Okay. Or we'll David. talk to we'll talk to him in between okay. about about snow storage and what's acceptable and what isn't, uh, and okay. we'll review that with him and also with Mr. McManus. Okay. Would the um would the detention basin have any um, storage or would it be a pass through? Say if it melted and there's salt or sediment in that snow that's melting, would there be any um, lag time or storage within the basin so that it's not just shooting through technically no we, we won't have the wet bottom so there won't be any residence time um yeah. so with that yeah we will we'll look at um different areas we could put uh at acceptable amount of snow um maybe some percentile of snow and we can show that our site can handle that and if need be we, we truck the rest off, off site. Okay. Uh, I was recently on a, a large commuter parking lot, which this isn't, but they had like the back row of parking designated for snow storage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that on the pavement would be best so that it would come through the stormwater quality structures before right. being discharged out. That, that's, uh, as Mr. Castelli has indicated, that's a, very common practice uh, that you reduce your temporarily reduce your inventory while you have major snow events uh, in order to reduce the cost of of uh, carting it off site if you don't have ample like when we had that 30 inch I know how much you got in Bloomfield but in my house we had about 30 inches of snow a few years back uh, occasionally you get a major snowstorm uh, and uh, sometimes back to back and so you reduce your available parking uh, for trailer storage that type of thing uh, temporarily um, so that you can reduce your cost for carting it off offsite, uh, like in downtown Hartford, almost everything's carted offsite. Uh, yeah. That's that's a common thing. So we we want to reduce the cost of that and the impacts. So we'll we'll look at that uh, for where we're going to store snow, and we'll we'll look at the um, typical for the Hartford area. Bradley, we can get the information for um, snow uh, rates uh, at any given point in the year, um, how much is on the ground, and we'll take a look at that. Okay. Sorry, um, uh, Katie. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Um, go ahead. Would we is is utilizing parking spaces acceptable? Could we show that and say that if we don't need? Because yeah, like I guess from a planning. I, I think it has. I think it'll have to be trailer parking spaces. Trailer parking. Because we 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 have to meet the minimum requirements under zoning for regular parking spaces, and we don't want to violate that. 
So we, it may have to be in the trailer parking area. Okay. Um, all right. Katie, did you have a couple questions? I did, and they had to do with the um, robust um, planting plan and specifically um, how will this mitigation area thrive? And I guess maybe Kevin Wilcox, our uh, resident horticulturalist, might um, also weigh in on this because I'm wondering if thriving is just for um, wildlife habitats by definition here versus like a pollination area and if that's possible because it doesn't look like any of the plantings are really pollinators. Um, and is, is that something that we want to make sure is part of the plan as a commission? Uh, Jim McManus here. Uh, yeah, some of the shrubs are pollinators. I mean, we've got the high bush cranberry, which has flowers that produce, and some of the seed mixes will have. Uh, but do we have enough, I guess, is my overall. You know, I mean, we'll have to wait to see the shape of this thing once the, all of the wetland boundary determinations are, and then we'll reassess at that point. Mm -hmm. Kevin Wilcox, did you have any uh, concerns well, about the plants? <clears throat> well, I don't. I don't have any questions. Uh, I do have comments if they would like to hear my comments about the plants. Sure. Okay, All right. So it was stated earlier by Mr. Jamison, and I'm sorry. I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just stating what I heard, or at least what I believe I heard. And it, if you could zoom into that mitigation area for me, please. Yeah. All right, that's, that's good. So for the mitigation area itself, you have all those shrubs, whether they are the, uh, let's see, whether they're the high bush blueberries or uh, the different viburnums, the uh, winterberry hollies, and so on. Those are all fine and well, with a few exceptions. Uh, but I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. The, the, the thing that I heard that, that always raises the hackles on the back of my neck is that they, these are plants off lists. And to me, what that typically means is somebody who, without the knowledge, of plants is looking at what somebody else has deemed appropriate as opposed to somebody actually going on site and seeing what's already there. Uh, so one of the things that could be done to rectify what uh, David Laupa was asking about for this mitigation area, and that is whether the native trees were being disturbed in this area of which you said, yes, they will be removed the area will be regraded. So might we suggest that you plant back into this area a couple of what are native to the site? And from walking around, what, whenever it was with Peter Castaldi a few weeks back or a month ago, uh, there are some very old and really spectacular native or the American beech tree which mm -hmm. Vegas grandifolia. These trees are probably anywhere from 100 to 150 years old. And uh, regrettably, where they reside is right where the trailer park uh, parking area will be. So they're going to be cut down. And uh, nowhere on the list is it stated that that tree in particular is being replanted. Uh, and you're going to be losing a phenomenal amount of our native beach. Now, aside from the native beach, we also have on that spot, uh, it's either our native black oak or native red oak. So, Corcus uh, rubra or Corcus uh, bellantina, bellantina. And what the architects have designed instead is Corcus bicolor, which is the swamp white oak. And they also have, what was the other oak? Uh, Corcus palustris, which is the pin oak. And I don't recall seeing that tree either on the site. Now, well, pin oak is out there. 
Are they native out there? Yeah. Okay. Well, they, I don't know if they're native, but there are on the site. Not a lot. Of, there's more beach than anything, but there are some pinnoaks out there. All right. Uh, I don't. I don't remember seeing in the leaf litter uh, that that leaf in particular. But regardless, uh, one of the things that I did notice when you zoomed into this mitigation area, and that culvert that we were talking about earlier, that is somewhat, yes. Uh, I'm not so certain that the architects would wanna plant an oak tree right on that area because that will, within a few years, uh, do some damage to that drainage system. We can relocate now, that tree. Yeah. Uh, the other thing would be they do list two different viburnums. One is the American cranberry bush viburnum, and the other one was uh, viburnum dentatum, which is arrowwood. Uh, both of those are regrettably being attacked mercilessly by an introduced insect, which is the viburnum leaf beetle. And in my, my opinion, a substitution, if you want to go with viburnum, would be viburnum nudum the uh, smooth wither rod viburnum. That at least wild, is not. Wild raisin, is that okay? Cast, castanoides? Because I, and yes. they might have put the northern arrowwood in because I noted it in my report. I, I noted it out there, but you're right. Okay. I mean, unfortunately, I don't see the northern arrowwood that often anymore. Right. One of the of other course. shrubs we could throw out there, the larger shrub is the ironwood, the uh, blue beech or the uh, musclewood. I know right. some of that out there as well. Don't you just love that? A plant that has five common names. You're talking about Austria virginiana? Or are you talking about the uh, hop horn bean, which is carpinus? No, not the hop horn bean, the, uh, the muscle wood. The, uh, I don't know. The, uh, the muscle you, wood is a very common name. Uh, yeah, you're, you're, talking about, uh, you're talking about the uh, horn bean, the American horn bean, which is uh, carpinus caroliana. Yes. yes. All right, that would work as well. Now, the other concern I have is they list Nissa sabbatica, which is, I think, a fantastic tree. Mm -hmm. The only thing is, I'm not sure if they want that planted six or, or five or six feet off that roadway, because Nissa sabbatica tends to have branches that are horizontally set, very closely set, and it grows much wider in its youth than it does high. And it may take easy 30 to 50 years for that plant to actually get to a point where it'll drop the branches out of the way of the trailers that are going back and forth. So in other words, they'll just constantly be having to either prune it or it will be self pruned by the, tr uh, by the trucks. We'll review that with our landscape, licensed landscape architects on staff. Yeah, that's sure. a very valid point. I agree with you on that. Uh, now, as for pollinator, the, the thing with pollinating or, or plants for pollinators, it's not just a matter of whether or not they have flowers. Flowers are short-lived. What we really need is more foliage because you need foliage for caterpillars to feed uh, and, you know, Without the caterpillars, you're not going to have butterflies. So that's where the tree canopy comes in into play. You need more trees than you do perennials or even shrubs if you want pollinators. Because pollinators aren't just bees. Right. But right now, if you remember from your site walk, there is no understory. No. No. None. No. Zero. And all three of the isolated wetlands. Minimal, if none. Minimal right. two of them. But basically, the only understory is right around the edge of the property. That's right. Um, Those are my comments. Katie, any other questions? Okay. Um, well, I'm not sure if it um, plays into, you know, protection of wetlands, but I, I am interested to know um, whether or not. Um, there was any attempt to purchase the property in the middle of this parcel? Uh, I know. 
We really can't go just, there. Building around it just seems like. Yeah. I'm so surprised that people aren't here, but that's, you know, we yeah. can't okay. get into that. Yep. Okay. But I'm I, all set I, then. But I hear you. <laughs> um, any other comments or questions from the commission? All right. There is no public. So is there a motion to table this to the next meeting, which is what, May 16th? So moved. Um, made by Kevin yep. Wilcox. Seconded Second. by. Second. Kevin Hussein. Kevin Hussein. Yep. Um, yes. Any other comments? Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? It's unanimous, so it's tabled. Thank you very Thank much you. for your assistance and for your Thank review. You. Thank you. Yep. Good night, all. Good, night. Good luck. Okay. okay. Uh, let's see what we got here. Panels are out, 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 out. Um, I would like to interject something here. And Kevin, you know, Kevin Wilcox. Yes, sir. If it this is too much of a burden, I would understand. What is? But is it possible, you know, with all these applications and all these different types of shrubs that people are promoting or, or, or suggesting they're going to put on site, is it possible for you to look at it in a way that, you know, what's rare, what would grow well there, what what are we missing or losing, you know, in the town? And we could have them or suggest to them that they plant that type of growth. Yeah, uh, that's what I was trying to get at. Well, uh, to be to be quite fair, Sharon Mann is doing a phenomenal job with trying to put trees back into our public spaces. And also she's in the process of trying to convince uh, homeowners in different areas of town to accept trees that are being donated by the town and her commission or her, what is she on? Uh, her committee. Yeah, her committee that are donating to them. Uh, so already we have somebody who's doing that work. Okay. When she, when she retires from that post, I'd be happy to not take over her post, but to do that with with this commission, if you feel it's within our scope to be doing it. I think if it's within the wetlands boundaries, we can ask them to plant different shrub, different types of growth. I, I have a, a, a thought on uh, the way to do it might be to uh, put it into mitigation requirements that you know we can require a certain type of mitigation. Um, what I was sort of angling at in this application and in others, is that I like to see a direct compensatory mitigation. So we're not just worried about putting flowering shrubs in every wetland, but if we're losing a forested wetland, we're replacing mm -hmm. it with a forested wetland. If we're mm -hmm. losing you know, a scrub shrub wetland, we're replacing it with a scrub shrub wetland. Um, you know, we don't require that level of detail in our mitigation um language uh, but that's some that's i think that's a place that we could put that okay all right yeah okay so moving on wetlands agents permits peter can't hear you sorry uh i haven't gotten any new uh, wetland agent applications. Uh, I've gotten a lot of interest in them, and some of the commission members uh, may know that the uh, the owner at 112 and 108 uh, Terrafill Road wants to rebuild his existing garage and put in a, a little bridge over a, over a drainage channel, intermittent water course, and, and other stuff. And he recently got uh, approval from ZBA to adjust the property lines. 
Uh, he is uh, hasn't submitted one yet, but he's going to submit an application uh, for a wetlands permit. Um, and actually, I think I'm going to refer it to you guys um, because it may be controversial. Uh, there's an old garage there, which is um, uh, proposed to be rebuilt with a modern foundation. And that's my biggest concern and its proximity to the brook. Um, but I don't wanna uh, influence your judgment that hasn't happened yet. So uh, I don't have any wetland agent permits. Okay. Um, What's that address I'm, again, Peter? 112-108 Terraville Road. Terraville. You can't get there from here. Right, you gotta go to Simsbury. You gotta go into Terraville Center and- Yeah, and come, come back, back down. up the hill. Yeah. Right. Um, status of ongoing projects. All right. Uh, the first ongoing project we need to talk about is 1236 Blue Hills Avenue, Mr. Andy Morrison. Oh, uh, well, and perennial. Yeah, I, uh, I know that the commission has expressed uh, in emails to me that they wanted to do a, a notice of violation and start finding him again. And I'll be happy to um, start that procedure if the commission feels it's either necessary or, or that's really something that we should do on a principle or you should do uh, for the principle. But I'm, I'm of the opinion that in this case, it really isn't gonna matter, which is kind of a bad thing to say. But he's, his, his uh, compliance is, is just not you know, what we, what we uh, normally get. And so he, he gets, gets approval from wetlands, the Wetlands Commission. So that's his green light to clear the whole site. He was supposed to have a meeting with me to go over the site clearing. He didn't do that. I think he may be over the clearing limit. So I've asked him we, uh, and his surveyor to mark either the clearing limit as it was supposed to be done or survey the existing limit of clearing and overlay it on a map so we can see if he went too far. I don't know if he went too far, but I can't tell because there's no wetland flags. What so happened to the, what happened to the wetlands flags? Uh, they were displaced. Well, we found some of them attached to trees that had been dragged, you know, away. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I understand the, what I understand where you're coming from, but I think that we, you know, we have to insist that he replant those flags so that you can tell where the uh, wetlands lines are. Yeah. And, and if he doesn't want to do it and do it in a timely manner, then I think we just, just turn it over to the town attorney. Okay. Uh, we can, um, if the commission wants, wants, you know, to go that way, then that's that's what we'll do. I can start. I mean, I mean that's my suggestion. I don't know what the rest of the commissioners yeah. want to go that way, or I think we I think we've been more than generous with him. Um, <laughs> he had an outstanding. He had a violation, which you know we said, okay, you've sort of met the requirements to have it removed. We removed it, and we even said we can reinstate or issue a new violation. And then, you know, pretty soon after that happened, there was another potential violation. Um, it, you know, it's, it's I, I, I think about all of the, um, the hoops and uh, not the hoops, but the, the consideration for um, the, the, the regulations that other people, you know, really, try to adhere to and it, it feels um not only disrespectful but um just i, I don't know just <laughs> just illegal <laughs> you know in in many ways and um i don't I, I don't get a sense of uh of you know of guilt or you know or anything remorse There's yeah no remorse. Remorse. thank you yeah i don't get a sense of that that you know it kind of feels like, okay, I'll do whatever you need and then I'll just move on and do it again. Um, so it, it feels like there really needs to be something behind these regulations that 
says that shows that it's a serious thing to do something wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I but I think you know, to to be fair, there should be a survey that you know some a licensed surveyor should go out there um, and identify the boundary the the previously identified wetland boundary, um, and then also identify any limitations that are beyond that, um, so that we have you know, hard numbers to work with, um, not just assumptions that something happened. Yeah, I mean, Peter, wh wh why don't we give them to like uh, May 9th to submit or to reflag re the wetland so you can inspect. Otherwise at the next meeting, we're going to, you know, get tough. I'd say, we, I'd say fine, fine retroactively and also refer to the town, the town attorney. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I think to be clear too, it, it should be the wetlands that were previously delineated. Yeah. Um, because if you get a different soil scientist out there, you're going to get a different line. Um, and you know, he got a permit based on the previously delineated wetlands. So, yeah. you know, a surveyor, a licensed surveyor should take that data that was created previously and the flag should be rehung where they were before. Okay. Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah. Um, About how much does something like that cost? Well, I don't know. What the theory? surveyor? The surveyor probably runs. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know if they have three man crews anymore, but it's probably something like two to three hundred dollars an hour. But it was so already done, so it should be pretty easy. Oh, it's to... already done, yeah. Maybe it's an hour and a half, two hours worth of work. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, uh, to in order to rehang or to restake the old wetland flags, if there's existing vegetation there, they can put it on that, but it's probably going to have to be stakes. So that takes a little bit more time, you know, pounding stakes into the ground. Well, Although know, the ground is very soft. You should, um, Peter, you know what? You should ask them to put the stakes in. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, by the ninth, by the ninth of May. And do we want to include the fact that if it's not done by the ninth of May, that we will uh, take action and retroactively fine and re um, well, we turn it over to the town attorney. This. Yeah, we can issue assist and assist and fine them, and we can do a retroactive fine also too. Yeah. Do you do you want me to start with a with a letter saying this is coming uh, for the ninth, uh, and then uh, well, we want it done by the ninth. Or these are the actions we may take. Right. Yeah. So there's a sense of urgency on his part. Right. Okay. Yep. Right. I will uh, run a draft by yeah. Alan. If that's okay what, with you, whatever happened with the last fine that the court issued, you know, it's as far as I know, it's still in place, and this is one of the reasons why I don't think that necessarily finding him again is 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 going to be effective because he's got daily fines up to the point where he has his wetlands and planning permits. He's got his wetland permits. He, he's going to be hurt again this month in planning, and it's it's thousands of dollars. Yeah. And so, it, it, so he, he's not motivated that way. Yeah. So what, what happens with these fines? If he doesn't pay them, is it just go as a lien against the property? I would I would assume so, yes, but I don't yeah. know for sure. Yeah, so in other town, words, it's yeah, it's just a to, slap on the wrist. No, the town has to go to court and get a judgment by a, a judge saying that he owes it, and then the town can put a lien on it. But still, that just that's just a slap on his wrist. Well, yeah. the, I think the court fine was eight hundred dollars a day, and that no. went out for months. No, I, it, my understanding is it was a hundred dollars a day from planning, and fifty dollars a day for wetlands or the other oh, way, around, I or the other way around. So it's it, it's that's been more than a year. So it's yeah. you know it's a lot of money. Yeah. Peter, do we have an option of revoking permits if uh, there's violations? To the permit yep so if he, if he's not in line with the permit that he has then 
I don't see why we couldn't have that mm -hmm. out there as a revocation of the permit, which would not allow him to do any of what he wants to do. But he's doing it already. Oh, I know that. <laughs> I, I've seen, I yeah. see the equipment moving out there every day. <laughs> right. I think we can, you know, that's, that's one of the options that the commission has, along with a notice, you know, official notice of violation or cease and desist order. Definitely uh, something that the commission can do. Um, but I don't, I don't know how else to um, get, get compliance. Yeah. You well, know, you know what, Peter, when you send them a letter, CC uh, town attorney. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I'm going to run it by you first. Okay. Alan, so that we, we have everything in there, although I'm making notes, I want right. to make sure that I've got it and, and I'll do that before, it, before it goes out. Um, I have a question about who's doing the work on his property. Is it others or is it Andy himself? As far as I know, it's, it's Andy and his, his crew. Yeah, he has equipment there all the time, so it must be. Yeah, him. yeah, yeah. I did. But, I, so I don't know who else might be. Yeah, you know, would wouldn't he just make more money? He has the equipment. Hire himself out to do work for other people. He doesn't get well, sued that way. Right. He does. He does do that. Uh, I believe his main business there is selling firewood. Mm -hmm. So you know, he's cutting down trees. And he's got a split, big splitting machine, automatic splitting machine. Um, but he also has, you know, outside jobs that I know that he does. So uh, I don't know. I, uh, after his planning, uh, after the commission planning commission meeting coming up this month, if he gets his permit to develop, he's still going to have to turn around and give us revised plans for per your approval per the zoning approval, and then have his permit, permit wetlands permit actually issued. So we're, we're kind of, uh, you know, we're again in, in the limbo of having an approval in place, but the conditions of the approval haven't really been, been uh, fully complied with. So um, can, can he have a planning permit if he hasn't met conditions of the wetlands right. permit? Exactly. No. No. Well, if, if he if he has a wetlands permit with conditions. Yeah, that, I think once you have the permit, you have the permit, whether you meet them or not is something else. Okay. But if we so, pull the permit, then he can't get zoned. Right, right. And I, I think that's where I was going is, you know, mm -hmm. I think that's the bigger <clears throat> the bigger bang for our buck is the not not necessarily the fines, but the right. the the possibility, the possibility of having your permit, your permit revoked, yeah. um, that yeah. won't allow. I think, for I think one thing. Yeah. I think I know Barry's yeah. here, but for the TPZ, can the, can we request going forward all applicants because they usually come before wetlands first before TPZ. We could check the status of all the wetlands applications, and if there is any violations or letters or anything like that as a recommendations for TPZ in their decision making. Yeah, I think I think we're getting in a gray so, area here with wetlands. I think well, that's that something come through up because with that. we know that obviously because we were informed at the meeting, Kevin, whether or not it's passed or any implications. So that it, it you know there are gray areas where we overlap. Like if earlier we were discussing the size of the parking uh, for those right. trailers, that's actually a site problem and it should be in the site approval. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, so you get in this area where you, you know, this commission is going to say, no, 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 we're impacting the runoff. So it's our duty to here to decide how big that area should be. So we're getting to all those kinds of little whirlpools of overlapping and things. But uh, I think the way it's set up now is fine. I don't, and you and I don't I see are here. it. Actually, Katie and I are here, and coincidentally, you're here. Uh, we bring that knowledge back to the TPC anyway. So we should be aware of everything that's going on. Well, I don't see Andy Morrison on the agenda for the 28th of the zoning. You get your package already? No, it's the 28th. 
He did it early. So. Uh, wasn't his uh, permit application tabled at the last meeting? Mm, might have been. I missed the yeah. last meeting. He's been around to so many meetings back and forth. Yeah, I'd have to sit down for two hours to try to figure out where he was. And what All right. Done. Well, that that's something I can check with uh, with um, Jen, our new town planner, tomorrow okay. yeah. to, to see what the deal is. If, if either of our commissions were ball teams, we'd have to give them a uniform. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. boy. He had two applications in March. Uh, yeah, one was, on, uh, oh, wait, one, on hold up. One was for a zone change, right? Yeah. Was two lot resubdivision. Was yeah, because the, of the old road and all the rest of that. Yeah, but what was last month's, did it include a site plan approval, Katie? Well, I wasn't there last month. No, no, no. I mean, the one that you're reading. You, didn't um, the map. you said he had two applications. It should have been three, or I thought he had three. There was there was one that was approved that in March, and that was for the zone change, right. uh, the boundary from R15 to I2 for just a portion, like a half an acre. Yep. But then he's got, he had two others. One was a special permit to allow proposed building with outside storage. Right. And then the was a sub, two sub, lap three subdivision. Yeah, for five, think, almost five acres. Yeah, I think those two should still, were and not- 15 approved. acres. Yeah, no, they they weren't. I think with yeah, they were held up pending the wetlands approval. Yeah, yeah, still. Okay, I will check with Jen on that to make sure that if he's supposed to be on, he's on. Okay. Okay, um, I have, uh, you know, there, there is some other uh, ongoing projects, of course, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, the apartments across the street from the town hall are, are still under underway, although um, Tilcon showed up with a grader and a large roller. So they're getting ready to pave uh, at the new apartments, which will be, which will be big. Um, the uh, apartments at 470 Cottage Grove Road uh, are inching along towards their completion. Um, the apartments at uh, uh, 65 Jolly Drive are uh, well underway. They're working uh, in some pretty um, wet conditions over there. So um, I've had to go and take a couple of personal looks and, and I definitely had some uh, uh, what's the right word, some uh, strong suggestions of how they should be maintaining their erosion control. Um, at one point they had the cul-de-sac open because they're supposed to extend the, extend the uh, uh, storm drainage into the site and the sanitary sewer. And there was a conflict with the MBC and road was open for a while. Um, they, you should also know that they may be coming in for a change to the uh, overall plan of uh, the entryway. Um, right now, if you if you remember the existing cul-de-sac uh, at the north end of Jolly Drive, uh, they had a, a, a two-way driveway in, the only way in and out, and then parking was right around the building. And they found that they really would like to have more parking. So they sent us some preliminary sketches showing uh, actually moving the cul-de-sac to the south and adding parking where the existing cul-de-sac is. And uh, when that comes to uh, an application, that's one that will, will come to the commission because that was a commission approval. They aren't proposing to change the direct wetland impacts, but they are uh, proposing to uh, change the upland review area of impacts. Um, and uh, the same goes for uh, the um, Ryefield Hollow uh, uh, condominium project, which uh, is coming in for a master plan approval at this month's planning meeting. Um, the commission may recall that they started with uh, 51, I think, units, uh, individual condominiums. Um, individual standalone condominiums um, or maybe some duplexes. 
and then they changed it to, or they upped it to 71 or 20 more. And again, they showed no additional wetland impacts uh, and they got that approved as a, uh, um, as a change to their master plan. Now they're going for a change to 91 units, many uh, duplexes and multi, you know, more than two. Um, and they're holding to the original approved wetland impacts, but of course they're gonna have many more, much more impacts to the, to the uh, upland review area with, you know, with that much more, um, that many more roofs, essentially. So they're going to go. Driveways. Huh? And driveways. Oh, yes. Yeah. And driveways, too. And they're proposing to the, the new developers who, who uh, have an option, I guess, are proposing to build similar to what they built in Granby, where it's condominiums. Uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's rental units with some uh, amenities like the swimming pool and a tennis court. So that's the kind of development that, that they're proposing. Um, but this commission has to worry about the impacts to the wetlands in the upland review areas. And, the, and it's gonna be more to the upland review areas. So that one's gonna come to the commission as well. Is that gonna be a public hearing? I don't know. I don't know. The regulations say that if they change the direct wetland impacts or the impacts to the upland review areas that it's considered a significant uh, modification to the permit and it has to come to the commission. It, it's not a, it's not a uh, administrative approval. Um, so uh, there's a, you know, there's a few other uh, ongoing construction projects, um, but uh, for the most part, those are the ones that I talked about are the biggies. So unless somebody has a specific question, I won't, I won't go into any more. Okay. All right. Any other questions? All right. So then we got to do uh, minutes from February 22nd. Yeah. Hang on. Let me get my copy here. Where is it? Before Katie goes into her uh, list. I won't because I, I haven't actually reviewed them and I was going to, um, abstain because uh, I, I can't uh, vote on them without having reviewed them. You can vote on them. But so can if you I? read them to should we wait till the next meeting? It's up to you guys. I mean well we can we can we can approve them on the condition that Katie reads them and sends to Peter her corrections. I will do that. So and I will do uh, it tonight after this meeting. Was that a motion Kevin? No, not yet. <laughs> uh, so, Peter? Yes, sir. Page number two, please, sir. Oh, page number two. Yep. Now, I don't really have a problem with this. I don't, whether you call me Commissioner Wilcox or Second Secretary Wilcox. However, but, uh, you do have two paragraphs where one starts Commissioner Wilcox and the following one starts Secretary Wilcox. And I don't mm -hmm. know if there is any confusion there if anybody reads that. Oh, uh, yeah. Wilcox is here? No, it should be secretary. We have, we have two Kevins, not two, not two secretaries. <laughs> now, in the paragraph that starts secretary Wilcox recommended, the uh, second line, it says, assess the pant health. I believe it should be plants. <laughs> That's all I have. Okay. That's a good one. Yes. Any others? Uh, anybody want to make the motion subject to Katie's approval and forwarding them to Peter? Or Katie's recommendation? Oh, well. So moved by Barry, seconded by Second. Kevin Wil uh, Secretary Wilcox. Uh, <laughs> all right. Oh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous. And that is, I think that's it. Uh, oh, no. no, there's more. You got to turn the page now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I included in your agenda package is a, uh, 
a summary of the wetland reg changes so far. And it should show uh, the recommended changes in red uh, if they're added and changes in uh, yellow and crossed out if, if they're gonna go, pieces are gonna be eliminated. So this is like a, a, a list of, uh, I mean, a, a compilation of all of the pages that we've talked about over the last month or two uh, concerning the changes to the regulations. Uh, I, I have to say, I did hear some good ideas tonight about adding, you know, more, uh, you know, more stuff for the for the mitigation from from David, and we can certainly add, you know, add more than that. But this is, uh, you know, these are the these are the sheets um, so far. Uh, when the commission feels comfortable with the overall changes, um, we have to submit them. Uh, to the DEEP uh, 20, uh, not 24, uh, 35 days before the public hearing is scheduled for their adoption. So until the commission is comfortable with the changes or we, you know, we come to a consensus on the changes, then uh, I, I don't want to schedule that public hearing because it needs, really needs to be two meetings down the road from when I submit it to the DEEP. Okay. So if everybody was happy with it tonight, and I think we need to add some more stuff about mitigation, and I submitted them tomorrow, we still wouldn't be able to have the public hearing until the June meeting. So I don't know. How does the commission feel about the, about the changes? Does anybody have any questions? I have a couple of questions. Okay. I may. Yeah. Sure. All right, uh, I, I just need a clarification. I don't understand why the wording is this way. On what's uh, page 10, it deals with the vernal pool habitat area. Hey, hold on a second, I'm sorry. I thought I had a new one. Yep. Okay, so it's not the 10th page, but it's page number 10. Correct. Okay. <laughs> Page 10. Sorry. Okay, what's the question? All right, so it says here, vernal pool habitat area means the area within 500 feet of a vernal pool, comma, or potential vernal pool. Why do you say potential vernal pool? Uh, because mm -hmm. sometimes in the year, some parts of the year, in fact, most of the time during the year, you can't confirm that it's a vernal pool. Okay. So we identify those that was obvious. I'm I sorry, that was obvious. I'm sorry that I missed that. Okay. It's actually, just so uh, you know, in, in, the, in, in the world of vernal pool studies, potential vernal pool or PVPs are, it's a very common phrase um, because somebody will say, hey, you know, it's August. That's a potential vernal pool over there. I'll confirm it in the spring. So. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, moving on to page 45. I like it. Almost to the end. <laughs> okay. All right. So in the paragraph that is starting with 14.6. Yeah. All right, so in red, you have the commission may levy a fine of up to $250 per day for violations of the regulations. Okay, now the next sentence goes on to say, and in the case of a continuing violation, each day's continuance shall be deemed to be a separate and distinct offense. I don't understand that. I think, I think that should be omitted. I think that's already covered under mm. what you have in red and bold. Yeah, yeah. It should end just at the end at, before it got into that. So, you, okay, that la the last sentence in that paragraph is is three three lines long, two and a half lines long. Yeah. And you, but, yes, I agree. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if. Uh, hmm. Because I don't see how it can be. 
can be deemed a separate and distinct offense. If it's a continuing violation, it's still the same violation. And oh, you're just still going to be, and you're still going to be level, uh, possibly uh, leveling a fine of still up to two hundred dollars, two hundred and fifty dollars a day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Doesn't have to be considered a separate or distinct offense in order to have more fines, right. or to continue the fine. Okay. Or, you, or it can be more than one violation, and there be multiple fines. Yeah. Well, then you wouldn't be considering that a continuing violation. That would be considered another violation. Well, instead of shall be, it could be maybe. Because I work with lawyers every day, and they love those words. Oh, oh, oh. You know what? Hold on. Each violation of said regulations or permit or order shall be a set of in the case. You know what? Keep it. Yeah. Keep, Keep the shell. I believe I believe I misread it. Okay, can I so so that's two strikes for me. Here's my third one. <laughs> this one this one may still hold water. All right. <laughs> I'm I'm now on the fee schedule. The very okay. last page. Alan's page. favorite one. Oh boy. Yep. The last page. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'm curious Before. why why were the fees reduced? For what apartments? For the length of water course disturbance, upland review area disturbance, and area of vernal pool habitat area disturbance. Why were those reduced in cost? Because you went from fifty dollars down to twenty dollars in the length of water course. You went from twenty from twenty down to ten for the upland review area, and then you also went from twenty down to ten for the area of vernal pool habitat. Yeah, I, w I wish I had a quick answer for you. I'm really not sure why those are reduced. I uh, I think in, let's see, oh, in two of those cases, I put in a maximum. Okay. Um, when you get an application for, uh, an, uh, uh, I mean, when, it, when we review an application that has direct wetland impacts, there's always upland review and vernal pool impacts. There, it's just the nature of the beast. In some cases, there may only be upland review area impacts, and that's where that's where I thought the um, uh, you know the the totals. Uh, some of our fees have been pretty high, but most of them come in high because of the multifamily residential apartments right. one num number three. Um, so I think it would be fine to to keep them at 20, 20 and 50, if you want to, uh, for- Well, no, I'm just, I was curious to know why. Yeah, I, well, I mean, you can but, keep them at 20, 20 and 50 because you have a cap there. No. Yeah, maybe the, I need the, to add a cap to nine too. Yeah, have a cap and leave them at 20 and 10, 20 and uh, 50, or 50, 20 and 20. I, I vaguely remember the conversation about Multifamily homes or condominiums or something like that. Yeah, um, but I I don't remember the details of it, but I remember that being part the, of this. The details stuff. are that I liked the regulation <laughs> and said seventy five dollars per unit, and if there were two hundred units, then that's what they paid. Yeah, and after years of being beat up, I finally gave in and let them reduce. <laughs> Right, because it doesn't represent the amount of work that's actually done by staff. Gotcha. Yeah, the, some some uh, people think that the the I shouldn't say some people. The there is there is some uh, um, discussion about the fees only being relative to the wetland impacts. So if you have more impacts, you have a bigger fee. The other side is that the fees are also supposed to cover the review. And you're right for a, you know, for a, a, a large apartment building, sometimes there's more to review, but generally uh, that's the, that's the, uh, uh, the one that falls through because you can have, you can have a hundred units in a relatively small footprint uh, for an apartment. But if you have that for the same amount for a, a, a 
you know, a, uh, a regular subdivision, you're, that's all going to be spread out. So there's definitely going to be more, you know, in that respect, more physically more to review. Per, per so we, sh we should look at this in a two dimensional space, not a three dimensional. Basically. That's right. So that's why it should be on, on the impacts, not the number of units, right. which gets right. you to three three dimensions. Right. Yeah. I, I will okay. tell you a funny story about that. There was there was a developer where I forgot how many units they built, but his wetlands application fee was like fifteen thousand dollars. And it was one building and he wanted it reduced and we wouldn't reduce it. When he completed the project and he had a grand opening party, he invited all the other commissions except the Wetlands Commission. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I won't I won't ask what project that was. No, I'm not even I'm not even saying. <laughs> okay. That's a well, pretty good idea. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, I think you guys want to keep the Nine, ten, and eleven at the at the fixed amounts, and put in a maximum for uh, yeah for uh, number nine. Yep. Well, what do you think I, the maximum should be? Ten, five thousand for water course. How much work is involved? What? Well, that's the thing. Number nine is length of water course disturbance. So at fifty dollars per hundred feet. Five thousand dollars would be ten thousand, right? Ten thousand linear feet. Yes. Yeah. So, what do we want to have for a maximum there? I don't know, five thousand. Want to do five thousand? Sure, we can do five thousand. <laughs> Why not? Okay. Well, uh, maybe I can. Uh, uh, There'd be very few people who are ever going to hit the maximum right. on water quality disturbance. Right. But it looks good. That there's a maximum there. <laughs> See, we're getting invited reasonable. to the openings. Right. We're being reasonable. <laughs> okay. Uh, David, maybe uh, uh, we can uh, look at the mitigation regs. Yeah, I, I like that idea. Yeah. Uh, I'd, yeah. I'd love to include more language like you had you had discussed. and. Sure. We'll try to, I'll try to make the changes we talked about tonight and do a similar thing like this for next meeting. That'd okay. Be a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Uh, only one more that I have, I think, is uh, the uh, discussion of uh, of the uh, updated official map. Um, and I am going to try to share my screen. Let's see, how can I do this? I know I have to open it first. So I've been working on this, this new map um, and it's a big file, uh, but let's see. Okay, now I gotta zoom this down. And where's my meeting? Okay. Alan, where's the button for sharing your screen? Uh, down on the bottom, it says the green button's sharing. Yeah, if you make it small, that doesn't always come up. It says, uh, okay, here it is. So this is the draft. Uh, I'm going to make it as big as possible. OK, so um, uh, several months ago, the commission said they wanted to do an overall map and then uh, individual sheets later on. Um, so this is my uh, attempt at, at an overall wetlands map. Um, and it has. Uh, it has, uh, well, let's zoom in and look to see what it has. It has uh, wetlands and water courses shown, uh, as well as street names and, all, and that kind of stuff, and, and actually property lines and some of the 
some of the uh, principal buildings as well. well. Go up Terrorville Road a little bit to that guy's house. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, here we go. It fuzzed in and out a little there. Uh, Terrorville Road no, no longer goes through. So this is number 12. This is number 108. This is the water course. Uh, hmm, I see that I've got the, I might want to plot the water courses on top rather than under the property lines. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's where it is. There's no wetlands involved here. It's, it's definitely a, uh, a water course. Um, so at 100%, this is what the map looks like. Uh, we can fit the entire town of Bloomfield on a map of uh, 36 by 24 inches uh, at one inch equals a thousand scale. So it's actually a, a pretty convenient scale. Um, here's the soils legend with all the information and numbers uh, and old uh, uh, Hartford County soil designations. This is pretty much the same uh, legend that we've had all along. Uh, I took off the bottom of the legend, all of the soils that are no longer found in Bloomfield, the Hartford County soils, wetland soils, um, which didn't make sense to show them if they aren't there, right? So uh, this is the legend for the graphics. Uh, the very poorly drained and alluvial soils are, are slightly darker green. Um, all of the uh, water courses that are, that are um, uh, polygons are this, this uh, bright blue and all of the uh, linear streams and channels and stuff are, are in this uh, darker, uh, slightly darker blue. Um, there's more, uh, there's more uh, possible breakdown of, the, of this data. I would like to show the uh, vernal pools and swamps and other uh, open water bodies different, each one differently. Um, the other thing that this shows, uh, which isn't in this list, is, is it includes all of the detention ponds. Some of them have water courses in them, some of them have ponds in them, I should say, and some of them don't. don't. So one of the other, or one of the changes I want to make is to break this, this one down more so that it'll show uh, what we have. I can find a, uh, I can find a good example here we, where we have a uh, swamp area inside the wetlands that should be, uh, that should be shown uh, with uh, little grass symbols for, for uh, a swamp. And now I'm not seeing one. This one might be one here. No, that one's a pond. But uh, in some cases, what looks like a pond inside a pond is actually a uh, swamp area around the <coughs> In order to show them differently, I have to use a different symbol. I quite, haven't quite got there yet. Um, the map also includes this, uh, um, this narrative. Uh, which uh, says what what the map is, uh, what you know, how the soils are, uh, wetland soils are defined, how the water courses are defined, uh, how the commission through section fifteen, uh, you know, uh, revises the map. Um, uh, notes indicating that the uh, um, you know amendments to the map require uh, an application in according with section fifteen. Uh, I might want to add on to that and a public hearing. Um, the wetlands are numbered. Uh, the larger wetlands in town are numbered. And back in 1988, the uh, town paid Inwoods Environmental Consultants to do uh, a townwide review of the wetlands. They didn't get every wetlands, but they got most of them. And sometimes you'll see in the back of my staff reports, I include two or three sheets from their, their review. Um, and then, of course, this we'll have to fill this in when, when it happens. Map was adopted. Uh, then. Peter, wait, don't scroll. <laughs> I, I saw a typo in your. Uh, oh, no. 
Where? Uh, wetland soils are defined by the Wetlands Act. Um, you're, you have very poor rural relief. <laughs> Oh yeah. oh yeah, there you go. Okay. Uh, Good one. Early. <laughs> At least I yeah. Uh, this is actually uh, this map is done with a GIS program that uh, um, populates. No, it helps with the graphics. Oh yeah. But this 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 is typed out as a big label. Right. And so uh, I can't it doesn't spell check it. It would have caught that. No, yeah. But I'll fix it. Yep. Good one. You just paused long enough for me to catch it. <laughs> okay, sorry. If I'm going too fast. Oh, yeah. no, no. That's, that's hey, 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 what the hell? Uh, okay. <laughs> so um, the next thing I was going to show is uh, a little, a, a, a secondary narrative that I have down here that just uh, gives a little bit of uh, geographical location, geological loca location, too close. So this is a description of where Bloomfield is located, west side of the Connecticut River Valley, south of the Farmington River and east of Talcott Mountain Ridge. Total area is 26.4 miles. And here's another type of wash rock. That should be Wash Brook, uh, Tumbledown Brook, all of which are in the North Branch, and uh, Griffin and Mill Brook are in the Farmington River uh, watershed. So that's the map. That's the uh, draft of the map, I should say. And what I, again, what I'd like to be able to do is to um, put this map on the uh, uh, commission's uh, website as a draft and see if what we get for, for input, you know, for feedback. Um, for the most part, uh, all of the uh, wetland map amendments, uh, except for the one we heard tonight, are on this map. So I'm, I'm you know, fairly up to date. Uh, uh, up to uh, through 2021, uh, uh, all of the map amendments are here. Um, the uh, uh, there is a list. I keep a running list of the changes since the 2014 map was approved. So I think it's time to to approve another map, uh, another official map. Uh, I think that the uh, um, the advantage to have a town-wide map is to, to see how much of Bloomfield is wetlands. And I forget, it's, it's a large percentage. It's more than a third. It may even be, it may even be uh, closer to, uh, uh, you know, two-fifths, uh, one page. So this is what the map looks like once it finishes, uh, you know, working. And uh, except for the few things that I discussed and the, the typos that we found, uh, you know, it's, it's almost ready to, uh, to go to a public hearing. So um, one of the problems that I have though, is that the file that I have, the original of this, when I go from the GIS to make a PDF that everybody can see, uh, it takes literally a few hours yeah. and it's 50 plus megabytes in size. But I also have a program that can reduce it down to about <clears throat> eight or 10. So that's what we're looking at here. I believe this is, yeah, it says revision small up here in the, in the title. So this is the reduced size drawing. Uh, it's si when I mean size, not physical size, but the size of the file. And it's still pretty clear. So again, at 100%, this is, this is what people would see. And I've got one of these hanging on the wall in the, town, in the office here, if you wanna come in and take a look. But this is what it would, you know, this is how it looks.
So let me Peter, zoom can in. you can you zoom in on the the legend again? Yeah, I, I was I was have had a thought about um, the color scheme, and I I, I don't want to sort of mess it up or mess up the the visual um, effects of it because I I think I think it looks really good the color scheme, but one of my thoughts was um, that you know by by definition of wetlands there's sort of two different groups one is drainage class and one is alluvial floodplain um, right. and I, i'm wondering if how how the map might look if you broke it into those two different groups um, i think the display that you have sort of has it so that we've got like the wet areas surrounded by the not so not quite as wet areas which yes is, which uh, visually I, looks good um, right I'm just, I'm just wondering what the like if we had alluvial and floodplain as one color and then the poorly drained and very poorly drained as another color um two separate colors yeah well i don't know i'm not sure i'm not sure <laughs> okay one of, one of the reasons why i group these two together the very poorly in the alluvial soils yeah. is uh because of a of a of a uh, uh certain part of the zoning regs that say you're you can't use very poorly drained wetlands or alluvial soils in your uh, you can't use them all you can only use 50 percent of them in your coverage calculations but it doesn't include poorly drained wetlands okay so uh the uh that's why these two are grouped together and you'll see let's go see some some alluvial soils uh down here near where Washbrook, where it all comes together down here. So this is the area of uh, well, maybe my uh, maybe my draft isn't as great as it should be. This area in here should be blue. Yeah. I'm gonna have to figure out why that why that happens. But the wetlands all around are 107, 102. All of the 100 series are, are floodplain. Or your layer, Peter, it's your layer. Your layer is below that. That's why it's below it. And when you bring it above it, it'll look blue. I'll, I'll give that a try, yeah. Uh, I believe, the, I believe the, the large file shows it. Yeah, it should look like this. Yeah. Anyway. Those soils, in this particular case, are all of these, uh, you know, the 100 series. And the weird thing is, is it places the uh, places the label like this 107 label mm -hmm. or LM is for this big wetland area, but that's the centroid of that. Oh, you, you can change that in in ArcMap in the um, mm. the label how it's late I forgot what it's called but you could choose change the um the way that ArcMac chooses where to put the label yeah um, yeah because it it shows the centroid but you could make it like in the polygon I, I don't remember there, there's there's something you could play with in ArcMap to change that okay uh because I was looking for a wetland number <laughs> And I don't see one, so that means they weren't turned on. Oh, okay. Yeah, here, here it is again. 107 LM is a, is a floodplain soil, and it's referring to this polygon here, the slightly darker green one. Yeah. Uh, I would, if we're going to show the alluvial soils separately, I think we should show three different maybe three different colors. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to overcomplicate it. I was just wondering if it would, you know, if it, if it made sense because from the, the wetland definition perspective, you know, you, you like I said, you've got those two groups. One is drainage classification and one is related to floodplains and alluvial. Yeah. Uh, oops, I didn't want to do that. I want to see the whole thing. Hang on just a second. Page level. So
in the definitions up here. This is the, uh, well, the spacing is funny with this too. Right, so wetlands are defined, drainage class, poorly drained, very poorly drained, and floodplain is alluvial soil, some of which are moderately well drained. Right. Right. And that's what, if you look, we go down to the bottom here, here's, here's some moderately well drained 102, 100, 106. So yes, I didn't, I didn't group them specifically by either drainage class or poorly drained, you know, and, and alluvial. But I think this way uh, graphically makes more sense. Uh, and it also, I think, alerts, um, you know, people where uh, that if they have those soils, either of these soils on their property, they can't use all of it for their coverage calculations. They can only use 50%. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, the, the, the bigger point is that anything that's green, whether it's light or dark, is a wetland. Um, right. So, yeah. So, you know, if, if the color breakdown is useful for other purposes, then leave it that way. Okay. Well, I can see that there's a few things that are missing from this map. So it's not ready for prime time by any means. Um, but it does, it does bring up the question. Now, this is the big file and it takes a while to regenerate. But I wanna see if some of the other stuff is, is on there if it doesn't take too long to regenerate. But what do you guys think about having, uh, having it available on the town, on, on the commission website as a draft before we get to a public hearing? I think I'm opening the, the door to, to a lot more comments than necessary. I think you're gonna get a lot of people who say, hey, there's no wetland on my house <laughs> because because that's gonna, it, we all know that shows up on the on the maps where there aren't amendments. So you're that's gonna my be, story. Every, uh, everyone, the first thing people do is zoom into their house. Right. <laughs> yeah, and, and the houses aren't you know exactly where they should be. Right, right. So I mean, I think you're gonna get a lot of calls like that. I I would wait until we just put the map out there. Because even I go in sometimes and I look at it and I go, wait, the house is over here, not over here. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I don't know if there's a disclaimer on the map, um, but we should make it clear that this is for planning for, or, you know, big plan, big picture purposes, not for design. Um, <laughs> um, you know, not well, that should definitely be on the final. Yeah. 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 I, I agree. Uh, that's a very good point, in fact, because we've had. Um, you know, we've had issues where uh, um, the, uh, the wetlands map doesn't show any wetlands on a piece of property. And when you go out there and you see, and there's water courses flowing through it, maybe it should have been on the wetlands map. Definitely should have been on the wetlands yeah. map. Um, but okay, I can, uh, yeah, we need a disclaimer. It also has to have, a, uh, it will have the town seal on it. That's not on it either. Yeah, I mean, the disclaimer could say something like, you know, the depictions on this map do not um, supersede ground existing ground conditions or something like that. Yeah, uh, let me open this one again because I have some language in the, in up here, I believe. Map depicts general location of wetlands and water courses, et cetera. Actual location uh, shall be determined by the delineation of the soils and soil scientists and surveyed location of wetlands and water courses. So, you know, this this can I understand what you're saying. Uh, a very this is not a real clear disclaimer. 
but at least there is a disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, well, it needs to say, uh, like we do on 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 some of our other maps, uh, some of the GIS maps that I sent to you guys has a disclaimer that said, based on the best information available, yeah, et cetera, et cetera, for planning purposes only. And I will I will definitely put that in there. Yeah, just say, just add not for not for design and construction. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I can do that and I'll have another draft for the for the next meeting. Sounds a lot good. of work. Thank you. All right. So, yeah, it's been since 2014. It's way overdue. I think we're done. One, one done. quick question. One quick question, Peter. I don't know if we can add it here. Coming back to the, um, the application from earlier or the violation. Can we add a statement saying that we, um, the Wetlands Commission or the Wetlands Agent can send a letter to TPZ with if all conditions been met for an application or no? Um, I, don't, I don't think it's uh, uh, even possible at some point to have all the conditions complied with before it goes to planning. The commission, uh, this commission, uh, has to send a, uh, a, a notice to planning, and it's usually the condition, uh, the letter of approval that lists the conditions. That goes to the applicant, and also goes to planning to say that the Wetlands Commission has has voted, has decided some of the conditions of approval can't be met until the project is After. over. Yeah, 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 yeah. You mentioned so that. I, that makes sense. Yeah. What about violations then? What about violations? That's a different. That's a different question. I think I think it would be appropriate to let planning commission know that there are violations. But as Barry mentioned, there's two planning commissioners here, so they would know. Yeah, but I don't know in future, let's say in future though, something happens and there's a disconnect between wetlands and TPZ. I know there's always going to be two commissioners, but it still would be good to have not to put those commissioners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both, both commissioners report to the same staff member. Yeah, and they're both under the jurisdiction of the planner. So essentially, the planners are sending a letter to the planner to get okay. down to the bare bones of this. So it gets, you know, and, and Kevin enough, also, to, enough into breeding. I think that, that. Uh, so many members from the zoning board have to be on the wetlands. Well, two have to be. Yeah, and Kevin had worked his way in somehow or other. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I saw a recruiting poster put out by the town manager's office looking for, for new volunteers for many, many committees and this commission. So you know, a lot of other towns that I've worked for have done that. And I gave the, you know, remember when we had that whole to do about who should be chairman of the commission and how often we should have elections for the wetlands commissions. Right. That had to be about 10, 12 years ago. And I just gave up after that battle. It just wasn't worth it. No one seemed to be interested. Yeah. Even you the, mean in, in, you know, the Committee on Commissions wasn't interested. Yeah. Well, uh, one, one follow-up thing, uh, speaking of uh, uh, agendas, uh, um, the town planner asked me today if we have a public comment section in our standard agenda. Oh, well, we're supposed to. Yeah. And uh, she what thought, hearings? yeah, no, she thought that it, it may be required by FOIA, Freedom they of will. Information. Wait, no, no, because they can't comment on an application. They can only comment on things in general. Yes. And they can't right. get up and say, look, I know this application's come up and I don't want it. They can't do that. But they can come up and say, look, I need you to take more, be more astute on um, wetlands violations and, you know, in some of the properties. But at the public hearing, they can say that, so. Yeah, no, but I, I understand. I think we could add a public comments, but it can be to anything. If it's for specific for an application, they can comment in there. Or, but in, in the public comments on the agenda, it's just to address anything or ask a question or do something, right? Well, if you're going to do that, then you should have a public hearing for every application. Yeah, but yeah, but they can't comment on a, uh, an application without the applicant being here. 
Well, that's true too, but how often does that happen? Well, it, it, actually, that brings up a good point that if there, uh, I think the co public comment has to be for non agenda items. Right. Yeah. So that would make sense. If there's a public hearing, that's where the public gets to ask questions and make comments. Um, and uh, if there isn't a night meetings. Yeah. If there isn't I'd a public say, hearing, then, and they want to submit a petition to have a public hearing. That's a different. That's a different question. I think, for the sake of transparency, we add it. But as you guys know, if we add it towards the end of the agenda, like now, public comments, it's probably going to get nothing. So at least we've said we've done it. Or if we want to put it in advance, that's also we can put it in advance of the agenda of all the public hearings, and then refer them back later. But we can add it, but maybe best to add it towards the end of the meeting, so that we. There's not much public anyway, here, right? Yeah. Before we add it, I would I would talk to Tom from FOI. I'll give him a call. I I, I like the idea of Kevin had about putting at the end if if we are going to add it yeah, because yeah. then they will have the opportunity to speak to the other applications that are on the agenda, um, and they won't be sort of in jeopardy of trying to get ahead of it by talking about something that's going to be you know, a separate agenda item. Yeah, that's that's the chairman's job to it arbiter is. those kinds of things. And you know and what? He, I wouldn't want to be a member of the public hanging out until 10 o'clock at night just to yeah. say something to you. Right. That's true. You you haven't <laughs> met the real uh, fans that we have sometimes. We used to have people. <laughs> no, seriously, uh, particularly on the TPC, there were five to six people who would come to every single meeting. Just to complain oh, about something. Remember the guy who lived on Blue Hills Avenue getting up and objecting to a development on Duncaster Road? So, mm. <laughs> but when we started the public works garage, the state issued some directives that there should be public comments at all meetings. And our then mayor uh, was strenuously in favor of it and attended a couple of meetings to make sure that I allowed that at the meeting. And it became a very difficult thing to implement. Yeah, I, I, I'll call FOI. I'll call them. Okay. Should there be a limit to the public comments at the beginning? If yeah, you that that, I mean, I'm, on, I'm on other boards and uh, organizations, and we had we got in trouble for not having public comments, but we allow them to, to two, you know, two minutes. But it, it's just a comment. It's not a question. So, well, that's what we do. You know, on the, on the zoning commission, we finally, years ago, split it up two ways. We have a period of questions and we have a period of, of comments. Yeah. Because they used to interject one and the other, and you, you know, just a mishmash of. Uh, yeah. I mean, so you know, somebody can make a comment, but and we don't answer. Well, that's a problem too. No, it's not because it's public comments only, two minutes. You specify it. Oh. So that it's on the record. And yes. we acknowledge it. We acknowledge a comment, then what happens when they sue you because you didn't follow through? Well, because it's, you know, it's, they can't yeah. comment on a, an ongoing application. Well, I'm not trying to play devil's advocate now, I'm honest. No, no, but you know, I, I understand where you're coming from. You're, you, you, you have a point, but I yeah. don't think that what I think wetlands is different than zoning. And the well, aspect, of course, you know, well, I would. Let's just say that we'll have Jennifer and the chair talk to FOI for you, Todd, and then get back yeah. to us. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense okay. to me. But I mean, and, and if he says we do have to, it would be in the form of two minutes of comments. Period. Yeah, it, it would work. If, if we need to do this, we're going to need to amend the uh, bylaws, which bylaws. has a list of our agenda items, and it doesn't include public comment well we could amend them so it'll be next year yeah <laughs> okay uh that's all uh, i would I like have, to folks <laughs> well, be, before I, I would like to say something about this and i'm sorry that i'm going to prolong this discussion is there a possibility of a place on the town's website for for inland wetland for somebody to post a comment that can then be asked by staff 
during the meeting. Therefore, well, they it is anytime. the record. They can, write, and, they can write Peter a letter and ask him anytime. Yes, if, if you look at the uh, agenda, it gives a link to, to the information, it gives a link to the meeting, it gives a link to the application, and it gives my, my contact information. And if they want to submit something uh, 24 hours before the meeting, then it becomes part of the record. And I would bring it to you, and, and we, we have done that on right. occasions. Sometimes yeah. they try to get it in on the day of the meeting, but it doesn't. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's it's always beautiful. Yeah. That's, I, David, I, you have to adopt my I, favorite phrase. Oh, to Peter. Out to the town manager. Yeah. Because Say it again, Alan. I've gotten comments that I've forwarded to you. Uh, Highland Road, that guy. Oh, yeah. yeah. But Wetlands is more structured meetings other than not, not the same as other committees. No, I think we're a little more structured than you are, but that doesn't matter. You, you, you adapt the model of your meetings and you run it that way. If it works for it. the present functions that we go through with the TPZ have been developed. Uh, I mean, my first TPZ meeting was in December of 69. Let me tell you, it, it was a brawl back then. And uh, it's entirely different. You just develop, you mature and adapt as you go along. Right. It's got to be a consensus, obviously, of the commission. Well, is that it? Yeah. No. One one last thing. Go for oh. it. I moved it. No, I moved that we adjourn this meeting. Okay. <laughs> I'll second that motion. Thank you, Thank you. Well, I like your thinking, Kevin. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, abstain unanimous. <laughs> Katie, right, so so. 10 o'clock. <laughs> I'm not a stating. <laughs> I read my minutes now. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We're still recording, people. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to stop the recording now. Yes. Now I, I have wanna... a question.